ask the council members. Recording members, in um, progress. Actually ask our city clerk to take roll. Right. Mayor Sanchez. Present. Deputy Mayor Kime. Here. Council Member Joyce. Present. Council Member Robinson. Here. Council Member Weiss. Here. Thank you, please rise for the invocation. Tonight we have Father Charles Wright of Prince of Peace Abbey to share some words of wisdom. Let us pray. Divine Creator, we come before you asking to appreciate the good which you have designed for us individually and collectively. Inspire our hearts and direct our wills so that our responsibility is made clear and our resolve is made firm to protect and foster these gifts you have showered upon us and this rapidly growing city of Oceanside. We are eternally grateful for the beautiful city and the ideal location. Help us to boldly face the need for growth while not losing sight of the need for the protection of those gifts which make Oceanside a desirable place to live and visit. Help us to face and sensitively address the growing problem that each city now faces, namely those searching for shelter. We realize that new problems call for innovative solutions. Give us wisdom, understanding, and above all, give us the spirit of peace, generosity, and justice. We offer all this to you with open hearts in your divine name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father Charles. Uh, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we got a couple of proclamations. This is the month of April, and there's usually two things really important that happen in the uh, month of April. The first one I'm going to call up is Earth Month. And I understand we have the green team in the house. Yeah. Come on down. And as is their fearless leader, Lindsay Leahy, the director for our water utilities department. This is what the green, mean green team looks like, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Nicole. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Oceanside City Council. My name is Nicole Cano, and this is my colleague, Brittany Perkins, and the rest of my Green Oceanside team. We're very excited to be here today um, to celebrate and honor Earth Month 2024. Over the past several years, Green Oceanside has had the mission of educating our community about environmental stewardship, as well as the power of collective action to keep Oceanside beautiful and healthy. We'd like to thank the residents, uh, first and foremost, because everything we do depends on them and makes it all possible. Um, and we'd also like to thank waste management. I love a clean San Diego, Oceanside Library, and Oceanside Parks and Recreation Department for their support in our upcoming Earth Day event this April 20th. Um, I'll hand it off to Brittany to tell you just a little bit more. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, we're super excited. We're gonna be working with our partners that Nicole just mentioned, along with a bunch of other local community organizations to be putting on an Earth Day celebration. It's a free event that's gonna be in Libby Lake. Um, it's on April 20th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're gonna have a bunch of different activities um, and games. We're gonna have educational booths. We're gonna have things like the zero waste uh, cornhole. We're gonna have coloring activities for kids. And we're gonna have um, the wa uh, water trailer there with free water bottle giveaways. So we really hope to see you all there. We're also gonna have um, a cleanup at the location and that's gonna be in tandem with the regional Creek to Bay cleanup. 
So we're really excited. Um, events like this, along with everyday habits, really do make um, a big difference in impacting the environment. So if you're looking for mo more ways to go green this Earth Month, uh, go to greenoceanside.org. Uh, thank you all for taking action, and happy Earth Month. So here is the proclamation, whereas the mission of the City of Oceanside's Green Oceanside Campaign is to promote conservation of natural resources, protect the environment, and to be better stewards of the earth through community involvement and engagement. And whereas each year, Green Oceanside, the green team over here, um, <laughs> partner with organizations and collaborate to facilitate public participation opportunities that help our community protect the environment through zero waste, watershed protection, water use efficiency, climate action, and energy conservation. And whereas in recognition of Earth Day in April 2024, Green Oceanside presents the Earth Day community event at Libby Lake Park on April 20th, 9 to 12, right? Yes, yes. Right. Um, where Oceanside residents and other community members can enjoy educational booths, activities for kids, music, and games to create a positive environmental impact through community action and engagement. And whereas on April 20th, 2024, the Oceanside community can also celebrate Earth Day by joining the largest environmental cleanup event in San Diego County to help protect our local waterways. And whereas through the combined efforts of residents, local businesses, and other community members, the city of Oceanside will move closer to achieving zero waste goals, protecting watersheds, increasing water efficiency, continuing efforts for climate action and energy conservation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Esther C. Sanchez, on behalf of the City of Oceanside, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Earth Month 2024, and do hereby challenge all residents to participate in Oceanside's 2024 Earth Day event on April 20th. Okay, Saturday, that's a Saturday, okay? So April 20th, 9 to 12, Libby Lake Park, to make our community and the world a better place to live. Thank you, guys. And I'll... Give this to Nicole, and we're going to have a picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. We also have National Fair Housing month. And I believe Maria, is it going to be Maria or who? Oh, Leilani Hines, Director, Housing and Neighborhood Services. Yay. And this is very important to us, right? Every, every year it seems like we're having uh, more and more challenges about housing affordability um, so it's very, very, you know, this is another proclamation for this month of April, which joins um, the Earth Day, but both of them so very, very critical to the city of Oceanside. So whereas April 2024 marks the 56th anniversary of the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, as amended, which, it, it, let's see, Enunciates, okay. It's this, that's what it says, right? Enunciates. Enunciates, okay. A national com commitment to fair housing without regard to race, color, religion, gender, national origin, familial status, and disability. And whereas Fair Housing Act was signed on April 11th, 1968, just one week after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And whereas this year's theme of National Fair Housing Month is Fair Housing, the Act in Action, reflecting a national commitment to advancing equity in housing and the importance of increasing public awareness of everyone's right to fair housing. And whereas the California Fair Employment and Housing Act of 1963, as amended, offers additional protections for fair housing without regard to marital status, age, source of income, sexual orientation, medical condition, gender identity, source of income, and other arbitrary status. 
And whereas City of Oceanside, in partnership with Legal Aid Society of San Diego, Inc., is committed to federal and state fair housing laws by continuing to address discrimination in our community, supporting programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities and implementing partnership efforts with other organizations such as Interfaith Community Services to help assure every American of his or her right to fair housing. And whereas Fair Housing Month has helped open doors of opportunity for countless fam families since its passage, making significant progress to achieving equal housing access for all individuals. And whereas the City of Oceanside acknowledges the efforts of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD, the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, and countless other state agencies, local governments, and community members for promoting fair housing. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Esther C. Sanchez, on behalf of the City of Oceanside, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Fair Housing Month in the City of Oceanside and encourage all Oceanside residents to become more aware of their rights and responsibilities within our community. So lots of lots of really important words. And I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic to you. Yes. So thank you. Um, it is April is National Fair Housing Month, um, and we celebrate the month with collaborations with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the state of California, but even more importantly, our own local community. Um, thank you to the city council and their leadership for providing housing programs, housing policies that really open the doors for our families here in Oceanside, despite race, despite religion, despite all of those arbitrary factors to open the doors and allow for housing choices and the freedom for families to choose wherever they choose to live and to open those doors for access to opportunity. So we really appreciate that. I do want to make a plug. The city of Oceanside also does a contract with CSA San Diego County. They offer fair housing counseling services as well as landlord tenant counseling services Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at our Chavez Resource Center, a very important place in our community. Um, and so you can receive services at that center um, related to fair housing. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Leilani, and here we go. Thank you. So wait, you got a picture? Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I do want to um, call out Lene Branch, who is here to talk about a very, very important event coming up. High school student from OHS, we are the best. Here we go. Good evening, Mayor Sanchez and city council members. My name is Lene Branch. I'm a sophomore at Oceanside High School and a member of the North San Diego County NAACP Youth Council. I want to extend an invitation to city council members and fellow citizens of Oceanside to our annual 420 Remix. This event is sponsored by the NAACP Youth Council in partnership with North County Prevention Coalition in the city of Oceanside and will be held on Saturday, April 20th at John Landon's Park in Oceanside. The purpose of this event is to provide a fun, engaging environment for youth to promote a healthy, marijuana-free lifestyle. In March, we organized a PSA poster video contest with the aim of boosting awareness about the dangers of marijuana and discouraging its use among adolescents aged 12 to 18. This group, the group entries will win cash and the individual winners will win technology. We encourage you to invite middle school and high school students to participate in the festivities. We are expecting a radiant turnout from our communities, youth and their families. We are aiming to create a day filled with interactive activities and wholesome entertainment, all dedicated to fostering a healthier, drug-free community. Thank you. Now, okay, so you heard the date, April 20th, right, 420. And we have Earth Month 
um, activities 9 to 12, but what time does this take place? This takes place from 1 to 4 o'clock. Yeah. 430. Yeah. yeah. So you can do both events on the same day. There's nothing stopping you. Please come on down. Thank you so much. OHS, we are the best. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry. Could, could you come back up? I want a picture. Could we have a picture? Yeah. Was this the first time you come to speak at a high school? Yep. Okay. Did a great job, didn't she? Yes. Thank you very much. Closed session report, Mr. Mullen. Thank you. The City Council met in 3:30 at 3:30 uh, in closed session to discuss item one on the agenda: conference with labor negotiator on the status of negotiations. Council met to discuss the Oceanside Police Officers Association non-sworn in the Oceanside Marine Safety Employees Un Unit. There's no action to report under the Brown Act. Council also met on item 2A1 pending litigation involving the workers' compensation claim of Blake Smith. Uh, council did meet and give direction. There's no reportable action under the Brown Act at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Next are consent calendar items 4 through 19. Are there any requests to speak from the, the public? The public has requested to pull items 7, 13, 16, and 18. Any requests pulled by the, by the council? And seeing none, um, any, uh, is there a motion to approve? Okay, there's a motion and second. No lights, please vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you, item number seven is approval of an increase to, to an existing purchase order with velocity in the amount of $200,000 for a revised total of 2,000, to, excuse me, 290,000 for fire engine repairs, approval of a sole source justification for velocity, approval of an increase to an existing purchase order with uh, Ken Grady Ford in the amount of 70,000 for a revised total of 270,000 for vehicle repairs and parts and authorization for the financial services director or designee to execute the change order upon receipt of all supporting documents. Who, is, who has pulled it? And this item was pulled by Nadia. Okay, Nadia. Is Nadia present? She's here. Right. Oh, there you are. So I think you guys know why I'm here it's to, again, call for your, the city to take proactive measures in divesting. I understood by a conversation with one of you guys, you don't understand what divesting means. We're not talking about federal funding that automatically gets pulled from our taxes. We're talking about the city choosing which contracts and contractors to work with. So with doing an increase in this funding, I'm very much against it because I am 99% sure that all of those things that do with Ford, and I believe we do have Ford um, vehicles, they are actually actively funding a genocide. I think we could better use our funds and not approve this increase. There's alternative, probably better equipment available, but you guys have not done the work. Please do the research and get better use of our funds. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to uh, approve? Okay, I'll second. Let's vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you, item number 13 is approval of a five-year lease agreement with Caterpillar Financial and the annual amount of $38,142 for a total amount of $190,710 for a backhoe tractor for the Harbor District, adoption of a resolution to approve the five-year lease, appropriation of $38,142 from Harbor Unrestricted Fund Balance, and authorization for the administrative office or designee officer or designee to execute the agreement upon receipt of all supporting documents. We have six speakers on this item. Okay. Our first speaker is Nadia, to be followed by Anna Maria, to be followed by Dan P.
Good evening, Your Honor. Or, sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> not Good a judge evening. Yet. Thank you. Nadia. One day, hopefully. I almost said, inshallah, Eid Mubarak. Um, also, April happens to be Arab American Heritage Month, but I know you guys aren't going to recognize that based on not recognizing Black History Month until two months ago in 2024. But at any rate, um, related to this particular topic, this is probably the worst company in history, and I'll let you know why in a brief little summary. Um, unfortunately, we have some people in here that are devoid of fact and actually spread lies. They say there was a ceasefire on October 7th. That is not true at all. But we're going to go into why we should not be funding uh, Caterpillar in particular, and that's because... Um, regardless of you guys not caring about Palestinians, we all know that Caterpillar is the one that is responsible for supplying the bulldozers to Israel, the one that ran over, viciously ran over, Rachel Curry, an American citizen who has yet to receive any sort of justice for that murder. Um, this began in 1967, that Caterpillar has been making so much money off of the apartheid and the subjugation of Palestinian people, whatever word you want to use, there's a number of words that can apply. Um, again, it's continued all the way up until May 4th, 2022, when Israel's Supreme Court actually decided that, hey, this is okay. You can expel um, eight Palestinian villages, and that happened to be using Caterpillar uh, bulldozers, which resulted in over 1,000 Palestinian deaths. Um, after that, we have in June 1st, 2022, another village in the West Bank and in particular in Jerusalem that resulted in over um, 73 people being displaced. That means their houses were destroyed because, hey, we can do it and you guys are going to pay for it. Um, they also are responsible for over 3,000 olive trees being uprooted. I thought we're for the environment. I guess we are not. Um, another 30 people displaced in 2019. In 2008, it was heavily used for Operation Cast Lead in Gaza, which uh, was the demol demolition of homes, factories, agricultural land, civilian infrastructure, including necessary water pipes um, that resulted in deaths that were not counted in the initial count because it was death by dehydration. And then we have um, the most infamous that it was used fervently during the Intifada, and then most recently, three months before October 7th, airstrikes and bulldozing in the West Bank, particularly Jenin, a refugee camp with unarmed civilians of Palestinians were killed, were homes demolished, and they used those bulldozers just because they could, and they asked why. They said for preemptive reasons, which means there was no ceasefire, and Thank they're you, the Nadia. aggressor. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll submit this for the record. Thank you. Um, move approval. Is there a second? We still have speakers. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Forgot. Uh, Anna Maria to be Anna followed Maria. by Dan P. And then Dan P. Okay. Um, I'm here to urge the council to not approve this um, Caterpillar backhoe for the Oceanside Harbor um, because I think it's important that the city start divesting from corporations that are committing atrocities in other countries like in Palestine. Um, Caterpillar has a long history of human rights violations. Um, you can find information on that on Amnesty International. They are complicit in the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine, uh, like Nadia mentioned, uprooting uh, olive trees that are thousands of years old. Um, they have bulldozed homes that have been occupied illegally. The, just recently in the El Shifa um, hospital destruction, um, it was found that bulldozers um, bulldozed bodies of murdered Palestinians, children included, whose arms um, had been tied behind their back. All of these are um, atrocities that have happened with Caterpillar um, weapon, uh, not weapons, um, machines. So I'm urging the city to take a stand for humanity and um, not not do this contract with Caterpillar and to divest for future from future contracts with Caterpillar as well because um, blood is on their hands and I, for one, do not want to see them in Oceanside. Thank you. Thank you. Dan P. Followed by Ryan Lynch. If you could, we got two podiums here. 
Go ahead, sir. Uh, dear City Council, my name is Dan, and I am to speak in favor of item 13. More importantly, why do I think the City Council should vote in favor of 13? The only reason there is a mobilization against it due to a discrimination effort to boycott Caterpillar to promote anti-Israeli agenda. I would like to mention a few things that you invented and produced in Israel. When you use your iPhone to take pictures, you should know that all the storage for the pictures is invented and developed in Israel. When you use your computer, you should know that every main chip is designed in Israel by Intel and Apple. When you drive your car and use in GPS, you should know that navigation technology was invented by Israeli Waze. In addition, literally almost every car on the road today has advanced driver assistance system developed in Israel by Mobileye. Now, especially in California, we have always shortage of water. The drip irrigation system used to grow your vegetables was invented and manufactured in Israel. Israel is a leading technology exporter to produce fresh drinking water from salt water. Moving to healthcare, the swallowable camera pill to diagnose digestive system cancer was invented by given imaging in Israel. Copaxon, a breakthrough medication for multiple sclerosis, was developed in Israel. I can go on and on about other revolutionary cancer and ALS treatments developed in Israel and used worldwide now. I'm just wondering, if God forbid, and one of the Israel haters end up in such disease in a hospital, would they refuse treatment because it was made in Israel? My only wish that people who are so energetically engaged in Jews and Israel hatred turn their jealousy into doing something productive and good in this world. Please vote yes on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan Lynch. <laughs> Followed by Macy. We've got two podiums here. Hello. Yes, um, it's my pleasure to address the council today um, for the same reasons that my previous speakers have been speaking about. Uh, it's very important for Oceanside to take a stand with public money. Um, the dollars that come from the city should not be spent on uprooting homes and destroying lives in the West Bank. Um, and I would just add that uh, the company Caterpillar is actually a target on the international um, BDS uh, movement, which is the Boycott Divest Sanction Movement, which is um, intent on holding Israel accountable for its uh, human rights violations. And, um, you know, as part of the broader uh, moment that we find ourselves in, we cannot allow public uh, tax dollars, American dollars, to be going to fund such, such um, uprooting of, 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 of lives in Gaza, of trees. There's an environmental impact that's been spoken about. Um, you know, the, the information that you need will be found by human rights um, organizations that have called out Caterpillar uh, for its complicity and, and well, you know, it's the, the use of Caterpillar by um, the Israeli government to to carry out human rights violations. So, um, I would just add that we're in a moment of uh, you know over 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, six months of genocide. The International Court of Justice has responded on this. Um, you know, it's part of a this move is part of a broader solidarity movement. 44% uh, of those um, thousands who have been killed have been children. So. This is a crucial moment, and um, I'm I'm quite sure that Ocean Siders will be will be standing up um, in the future about this. And this is a contract that can't go through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Macy. Mayor and City Council, I would just like to ask that you please consider alternate companies rather than Caterpillar for the five-year Harbor Bulldozer lease. There are other brands we can support that aren't complicit in human rights violations as found by the renowned human rights watch campaign, Amnesty International. From their article on Caterpillar's direct role, quote, cat equipment has been used to uproot olive trees and destroy other agricultural products and land. During Operation Cast Lead in the Gaza Strip in 2014, Israel used armored D9 bulldozers to demolish wide swaths of homes, factories, agricultural land, and civilian infrastructure, including water pipes and networks needed for basic survival. Another quote from the article, any actor considering a relationship with Caterpillar or any corporation or company whose services or products have played a role in violation of human rights should ask that company to demonstrate its commitment to human rights and to ensure that it does not contribute or benefit from human rights violations, end quote. Right now in Gaza, according to Forbes, the Caterpillar D9 
a 110,000 pound bulldozer that can be fitted with crew operated machine guns and grenade launchers is destroying what's left of hospitals and homes. This is the same bulldozer that ran over Rachel Corey in 2003, someone my age that looked like me that believed in what I believe in. The same bulldozer that was used recently in Gaza as admitted by the IDF to run over two Palestinian civilians that moved in a quote, suspicious manner. This is an image of the man crushed by IDF bulldozers and shared in a Telegram group chat with thousands of people that translates to, this is what the Nazi from the filth strip looked like after he had an intimate acquaintance with the tank's caterpillar, followed by more expletives I can't and won't repeat. We can play dumb and act like we just need a bulldozer for the harbor, but the reality is that our purchases matter and the Caterpillar company is perhaps the second on the list in terms of destruction of Palestinian life in all forms, just, befi just behind the 5,000 pound bombs we just sent, and everyone on this council besides Eric Joyce can't find the courage to speak out against. If you go through with this lease, there will be even more blood on all your hands. Please consider alternative companies that aren't directly involved in an ongoing genocide. Thank you very much. Uh, Omar Hashimi. Good evening, Mayor Sanchez, uh, Council. My name is Omar Hashimi. Tonight, I stand before you to voice my opposition to the approval of item number 13. Machinery from Caterpillar has been employed by Israel in actions that include the ethnic cleansing and forced displacement of the Palestinians. This is evident through the demolition of their homes, farms, and businesses, as well as the construction of illegal settlements on expropriated land. Such actions constitute war crimes under the international law, under international law, and our city should not have any business relationship with such companies. There are better alternatives of companies who provide the same machinery we can use, and we should not, and we should be using those companies instead. I ask that you reconsider leasing from Caterpillar and look to their competitors in order to disassociate any part in an illegal occupation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. Any other, any comments from the council? Okay, I just had a quick question. Is there an alternative to Caterpillar? Honorable Mayor Sanchez, members of the City Council, Joe Ravich with the Harvard, I'm the Harvard Division Manager. Um, there are there are two alternatives that I saw recently, Komatsu and Kobatu, I want to say, if I'm not pronouncing if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, Caterpillar is for sure the largest, and they're a source well company as well. So we didn't consider the other. Okay. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Uh, I'll go ahead and second. Any request to speak? Okay, let's let's vote. Motion approved, 4-1, Joyce Thank you, no. item number 16 is acceptance and appropriation of an additional 230,278 in grant funds from the state of California. Excuse me, we, we still have, we still have a, a meeting here. From the State of California Law Enforcement Activities sub-account awarded to the City for the Citizens Option for Public Safety, that's COPS, 2022 grant program, and authorization for the City Manager or designee to execute all grant documents. Who's this, requested? This item was pulled by Nadia. Oh, Nadia, okay. I would like to waste more of my time uh, speaking on matters, but you guys have absolutely no discussion. I do attend a lot of city council meetings without speaking, just to observe, learn, and grow in the process. Every other single city council in this state has actual discussions on the motions. You guys have failed to even talk to each other, to even have any sort of re recollection or acknowledge what's going on. There's two alternatives, and you guys did not even table it to see what the others were. It's absolutely disgusting. And for this particular item, anything involved with law enforcement needs to be extra scrutinized because as um, one of the Zientologists just spoke, 
A lot of our technology that it's used to target black and brown lives comes from Israel, has been proven to not be accurate when it's tested on Palestinians, and we're going to use that to further our civil rights abuses here. Are you kidding me? So I'm totally against anything that's going to have an increase in funding to the police until we see changes that are actually good. I hate that I had to go into court and have an attorney from Carlsbad make a joke with the judge saying how awful the Oceanside City Police are because they could not even um, comply with a simple body-worn cam uh, release of discovery. They are incompetent, as he said, and the judge said, yeah, I know, dealing with Oceanside. I was embarrassed to be an Oceanside attorney and I have to have a continuance because of our um, lack of ability, I guess, and what they're saying, incompetence. And so you're telling me we're going to increase funds when we can't even do the bare minimum? I don't think so. I'm against it. Please actually have a discussion on the matter. Thank you very much. <laughs> any, any comments? I move approval. Is there a second? second. Okay. Um, let's vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you. Item number 18, acceptance and filing of the housing element annual progress report for calendar year 2023 pursuant to government code section 65400. This item was pulled by Jimmy Knott. Mr. Knott. Mayor, councils, Jimmy Knott, 127 Sherry Lane. Uh, my concerns on this uh, is very simple is as part of the housing element that's uh, being considered in an annual progress report is housing protections, especially for mobile home park owners and renters. And the comparisons of the CPI and the annual increase in Social Security increases. They are way out of sync even for city-charged utility. Therefore, there are threats and measures to the homeowners who are low income. I would like to see into any of the reports any proposals from our housing department and to protection to assist these folks who may be at a victim type level that could affect their home, their livelihood, or quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no comp. Okay, there's a motion to accept and file. Is there a second? Okay, uh, let's vote. Motion approved, 5 0. Thank you very much. Now to general items. Um, I would like to let, first of all, before we move forward, uh, we do have one item that has been pulled from the agenda, and that is from the 6 o'clock um, time certain matters, and that is item number 23. Item number 23 has been pulled, so it will be continued to the next. Uh, item number 22. Me, 23. 22. Um, 22. Oh, my apologies. 20, 22. 22. They're both historic. <laughs> um, but 22 has been pulled and will be heard at the next council meeting. So um, item number 20 under general items is acceptance of report on residential tenant protections, including information regarding California Assembly Bill 1482 and Senate Bill 567. And we have a report by Ms. Leilani Hines, Housing and Neighborhood uh, Services Director. Ms. Hines. Good evening, honorable mayor, council members, and the public here this evening. At the city council's workshop on affordable housing production back in August 30th, 2023, staff received direction from the city council to return with a future item to report on those tools available to address residential tenant displacement, including a discussion on any measures other cities take to protect their residents from unwarranted displacement. Tonight, staff will be presenting a report on residential tenant protections as governed under state civil code, the California Protections Act of 2019, also known as AB 1482, with a subsequent amendment that became effective um, on April 1st, and that was Senate Bill 567. 
So after hearing tonight's presentation, staff will recommend that the City Council take the following actions to accept the report on these two very important um, state laws and other local measures to address tenant protections. We're requesting this, that the City Council provide us direction to proceed with a program for outreach and education to inform our residential tenants of their rights and to also remind our landlords and their agents um, of their legal obligations under the state law. We are also requesting that uh, the City Council approve a budget appropriation in the total amount of 25,000, 20,000 of which would be to amend the scope of work of an existing contract we have with CSA San Diego County to provide those types of education um, and outreach activities and then $5,000 for any city costs that might be related to materials and supplies um, in our outreach efforts. So the California Tenant Protection Act of 2019 um, requires justification for the termination of tenancy at, at both at fault or no fault. The impact of this law really affects our Oceanside tenant population. It's significant in that 41% of our housing stock is rental housing. We have a lower than average vacancy rate at around 3%, five to six is the normal or healthy rate. 74% of our lower income renters face uh, housing cost burdens. And these are the households that are a greater risk of housing instability. They may downsize their housing or relocate out of necessity. And in some cases, you'll hear that experiencing homelessness due to evictions. So the aim of 1482 is to provide residential tenants with that price stability, some level of certainty, protections from retaliatory evictions, and to minimize displacement when possible. So landlords are required to provide a list of just causes in their written notice to terminate a tenancy. It also provides for the statewide, which you often hear as statewide rent control, and sets an annual rent cap on increases at 5% plus the change in cost of living as measured by the CPI, not to exceed 10% in any given year. For the last two years, that rent cap has been at 10%. There are certain exemptions from AB 1482. <laughs> Tenant protections really apply to almost every rental situation. So whether you're in a traditional apartment community, um, or in a single family home, a condo, a town home, with just a few key exceptions, those properties that are exempt from state protections include newer apartment communities, those that were built within the last 15 years or 2009. Uh, that was very specific for the state legislator and legislature in that they did not want to disincentivize new construction of housing. It also should be noted that 98% of Oceanside housing stock is actually older than 15%, so most of it would be applicable um, to our housing stock. Single family residences that, and condos and townhouses houses that are not owned by business entities, so your typical mom and pop, um, they are not included within these protections. Owner-occupied duplexes, housing that's already restricted as affordable housing, institutional types of living arrangements like school dormitories, and then specific mobile home uh, park communities, which are already governed by our own local ordinance. So the just cause termination really affects all residential tenants. Um, irregardless of income. So this is not about necessarily affordable housing, although it uh, does impact those at lower levels um, more. Uh, tenants need to be in continuous and lawful occupancy of that real property for a minimum of a 12-month period. And then property owners or their agents must provide a written notice, a 60-day written notice of termination, and they have to provide the specifics as to why that termination is being uh, provided. And those evictions can be at fault or where a tenant took actions or took a lack of actions that warrant ending the tenancy. Typical issues might be non-payment of rent, uh, violations of the terms of their lease, 
And then under no fault, these are evictions that even though you may be paying your rent on time, you're a good tenant, um, you're still being terminated from your tenancy. And those would include an owner or the owner's family member who's looking to move into the property, demolition or a substantial remodel of the property, uh, governmental action, so example would be if a, if a home was red tagged or deemed uninhabitable, that could be a government action, a court order or other law forcing the closure of that rental property. In the case of a no-fault eviction where the tenant really didn't do much wrong here, there is a requirement to provide relocation assistance or to waive the rent equal to one month of the contracted rent. And I highlighted two specific instances, the substantial rehabilitation and the owner family move in. Uh, we have heard stories and you will hear of stories of families who talk about the fact that they have been evicted from their home because the owner is remodeling, when that remodeling may just be replacing carpet, painting the home, which is pretty typical um, maintenance procedures that you would do anyways, and that does not necessarily constitute substantial rehab, but then they're evicted, and then a few months later, the unit's put back on the market and rented at a higher rent. Um, same with owner or family move in. And as a result of those two types of just cause terminations, Senate Bill 567 was introduced and became effective just last week. It amends and tries to close those perceived loopholes in the law. For example, it requires owners who end a tenancy for substantial remodeling to also include very specific language in that noticing. The notice must state the work that's going to be performed, the availability to receive copies of any required permits, the date the owner expects to complete the work or demolish the building, notification that if the remodel or demolition is not commenced or completed, the tenant must be offered the opportunity to re-rent the unit at the same rent and at the same contract uh, terms. For evictions that are based on the owner or the owner's family move in, that relative must move in to the unit within 90 days after the tenant leaves. The owner also has to live in the unit or the family member needs to live in the unit as their primary residency. So not just for a couple of days of, week, of the week, but it's their primary home. The notice also has to disclose the name and the relationship of that family member uh, to the owner. And then the tenant can also request proof that the intended occupant is a qualifying relative of the owner. And then four, that there's no other unit within that complex that that resident or the family member could move into instead of that specific unit. So a lot more requirements in the law from SB 567. And then lastly, um, if the relative doesn't move in within the 90 days, if they don't do that, then again, it would be offered to, for the tenant to move back in at the same rent, the same lease terms, and then even given beyond the, the relocation assistance, they need to be reimbursed back for any re reasonable moving expenses. SB 567 also puts a little bit more teeth into the law, including um, civil actions and damages up to three times the actual damages when someone's trying to recover possession of the unit. If a property owner is demanding more than the rent that's actually allowed, and it actually authorizes the attorney general and even our own city attorney to bring actions for injunctive release, relief against the property owner. The state is also active in the accountability of our state housing laws. We've heard from uh, the Attorney General's office and the GOJ regarding some of our housing policies and other cities also have heard of that as well. But they're also involved in tenant protections. The DOJ has actually taken three enforcement actions, whether to a large property owner, smaller property owners, 
uh, uh, property management companies related to tenant protections. The Attorney General has also issued a total of nine consumer alerts um, about knowing your rights that are available on their website in 24 different languages. The DOJ also offers a online complaint form where tenants who, are, who believe that they, their rights have been violated can file online against the property owner. So from a local perspective, only two jurisdictions in San Diego County have implemented tenant protections, one of which is the city of Chula Vista, who adopted their tenant protection ordinance effective March 23rd after a lot of discussion with their uh, consultants, stakeholders, tenants, property owners, um, collecting local data that began in September 2021. So it was a long road for them. Their TPO is also in alignment with all the state laws. The key difference between their ordinance and the state's ordinance is that it includes all rental housing. So the 15 year age of the structure is not in their ordinance. Um, it also provides protections beginning on day one versus requiring that folks be in place for 12 months. And then the level of assistance is a little bit greater, where the state law requires one month, they require two months of assistance, and then three months of assistance for seniors or persons with disabilities, and also requires that uh, property owners submit a notice of the eviction to the city of Chula Vista. To date, they've received notices since March 2023, They've only received 65 eviction notices within their community. In February, also, uh, their city council did direct staff to return in six months to review and discuss those enhanced protections and to see if there was a need to revise the TPO. The city of San Diego is a little bit different in that they already had a right to know ordinance that was effective in 20, 2004. And they needed to revise that ordinance in order to be in compliance with state law. They also had a significant outreach effort and a working group with industry and tenant advocates, community engagement, um, work in the council president's office. And then in June 2024, in June 24, 2023, that ordinance became effective. It is much the same as the city of Chula Vista. It does have a little bit more in terms of education and noticing requirements within their ordinance. For example, providing resources, requiring that notices actually be posted on the property, and then going a little bit further with accountability measures. For the city of Oceanside, we've been focusing on what the real issue is. Uh, which is affordable housing production. That's really the long-term solution for our issues. We have uh, assisted with the development of a 60-unit Greenbrier Village development that's scheduled to open this summer, 43-unit South River Village that uh, just got funded this year. We issued a NOFA for $6 million to get another affordable housing development. We have 450 lower-income units in the development entitlement pipeline through inclusionary housing and density bonus. We've also provided uh, tenant-based rental assistance, a sort of short-term program, one million in phase one that assisted 72 tenants. You will be seeing phase two coming soon for another million dollars. That's being funded out of our federal home dollars. We have contracted with CSA San Diego County that began just in July, 2023. They provide counseling for landlord-tenant issues, fair housing issues. They do provide office hours, even though they're located in the East County. They provide office hours at our own Chavez Resource Center on, on uh, San Diego Street, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. They can be reached by email or by telephone. And to date, since July, they've assisted 28 households. The majority of those types of counseling services and calls are related to landlord-tenant issues, either uh, rents being high, uh, problems with landlord maintenance issues, and to some degrees, eviction issues, discrimination issues as well. 
I wanted to point out that our housing website offers a page that's to, that provides direct information on landlord tenants' rights and responsibilities under the state law, all the resources available under state protections, CSA, uh, links to the San Diego Superior Court Self-Help Center, so a lot of information on our housing website. Uh, council last year also provided a program that helps with mitigating some of the barriers our tenants face in assisting with tenant screening reports and reimbursing our tenants who are looking for new housing. So we've done a lot in the city of Oceanside related to some of these short and, short and long-term strategies to address housing issues and displacement issues. This was scheduled in March. Uh, since there was some time lag in between, we did present to the Housing Commission and to the Community Relations Commission this very same report. Uh, based upon those presentations, some of the input that we received is that uh, both commissions felt that it doesn't cover folks. Uh, it, it starts at 12 months. But people who might be, like students, who might be in shorter-term housing for nine months, it doesn't cover those shorter term leases. Um, and that you don't know what you don't know. So education really is a key component. Mm. They really would like to see more disclosure up front. Like for example, when you go to buy a house or buy a property or even in your lease agreement, there's always a stack of papers of disclosures. So seeing a disclosure about tenant protections as part of that leasing packet is something that they would also think would be a great idea. Um, and we also uh, received input that tenants also need to be educated on what their responsibilities are to be a good tenant um, and to preserve their right to remain in a rental property. The Community Relations Commission went a little bit further and thought that all single family homes should be covered, not just the ones um, that are owned by business entities. And they also believed um, that legal guidance should be provided before an eviction. And so don't get all the way to eviction and then get an attorney, but be more preventative and uh, try to interrupt that cycle as early as you can by providing some type of legal services. So with that, staff is recommending that you accept the report that's been provided to you, that you provide direction to proceed with an outreach and education component. And that is really based on the fact that SB 567, we believe, uh, may close a lot of the loopholes that we are seeing or hearing about anecdotally. That only became effective on April 1st. We don't know the full impact of that. Um, any any further action, I think, would require a lot more um, discussion and analysis. And so we are advocating for more of an outreach and education component. And to do that, we would request a budget appropriation in the amount of $25,000 to have CSA assist us in that component, and then an additional $5,000 for any additional or incidental needs that the city might have if we're to do our own outreach. Um, campaign and, and education for any materials and supplies that we would need as staff. So with that, that concludes staff's report this evening and we're available to answer any questions. Thank you very much and it is six o'clock so we're gonna have to take a pause here on this item, item number 20, and go back to it. I understand there are three speakers on this so we wouldn't be able to complete this item. So um, next item is item number 23. Um, and this is adoption of a resolution approving a historic permit, H23-00004, to repair and restore walking paths and fencing, install interpretive signage and benches, and plant a native plant garden at the Mission San Luis Rey Lavanderia. The project is categorically exempt pursuant to Article 19, Section 15302, which is replacement or reconstruction of the California Environmental Quality Act, San Luis Rey Lavandaria project applicant is Gwen Grimes. Um, I'd like to go ahead and move, uh, open this public hearing, excuse me, and ask council members for disclosure regarding constituent contacts and correspondence. 
Staff only. Uh, just the staff report. Just some public. Staff report. Staff report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Navarro, do we have any correspondence on our petitions? Uh, we have not received any correspondence or petition on this item. Okay, we're going to go ahead then and begin with uh, Ms. Shallon. Shannon Vitali, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, our senior planner, Ms. Vitali. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council. Shannon Vitali, senior planner in the Development Services Department. I'm here this evening to discuss agenda item 23, a historic permit for the Mission San Luis Rey Lavanderia. Staff is recommending the City Council approve a historic permit to allow site improvements, which would protect and enhance the Mission San Luis Rey Lavanderia site. The Lavenderia, which is outlined in red on this slide, is located on the southern portion of the Mission San Luis Rey grounds, located at 4050 Mission Avenue. The site has a land use designation of private institutional, a zoning designation of Mission San Luis Rey plan development with a historic overlay, and is within the San Luis Rey neighborhood planning area. When the Lavenderia was operational, water diverted from the San Luis Rey River was used to serve as a bathing site and a place to wash clothing. The structures also provided a means of channeling water into the mission's gardens and fields. Due to its historic significance, in 1955, the Lavenderia was designated as an archeological site. In 1983, the city designated the area as a historic area, and in 1992, the project site was included as a historic resource in the city's cultural resources survey. In 2003, the City Council adopted the Mission San Luis Rey Plan Development Plan to establish design guidelines for the development in the mission, including the Lavenderia site. The project before you tonight consists of a historic permit to allow the following. The replacement of existing posts and fencing surrounding the Lavenderia site, adding decomposed granite to repair the existing pathways surrounding the Lavenderia, extending the pathway to connect to the newly constructed Hacienda Senior Living Project, and adding interpretive signage and benches along the pathways and planting a new plant garden with native plants. The image on the left illustrates the existing pathways in blue and the new pathway, which would connect to the Hacienda Senior Living Project in orange. The native plant garden would be planted at the northeastern section of the project site. New fencing would look similar to the fences shown on this slide, and new signage would be similar to what's shown in the bottom right of the slide. San Luis Rey Mission staff have discussed the project with representatives from the Lewis Enio tribal groups, and tribal monitors will be present during any ground disturbance activities. As described in the staff report, the project was reviewed for compliance with Chapter 14A of the Municipal Code, the City's General Plan and Zoning Ordinance, the Mission San Luis Rey Plan Development Plan, and the Mission San Luis Rey Development Program and Design Guidelines. Staff finds the project is compliant with all the applicable city policies and development regulations for historic properties. Since the project enhances and further protects a designated historic resource, the project helps to implement the goals and policies of historic preservation. On January 30th of this year, staff brought, before the, staff brought the project before the Oceanside Historic Preservation Advisory Commission. The commission voted unanimously to support the project. Therefore, staff is recommending that the City Council adopt a resolution approving historic permit H-234 to repair and restore walking paths and fencing, install interpretive signage and benches, and plant a native plant garden at the Mission San Luis Rey Lavenderia. That concludes my presentation. Um, the, applicant also, yes, <laughs> the applicant also has a presentation for you. And then we'll both be available for questions. Thank you very much. So, applicant, come on up. Hi, Gwen. Good morning. Good evening. <laughs> almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for allowing me some time this evening. I'm Gwen Grimes, the Executive Director at Mission San Luis Rey. Um, uh, uh, as uh, Shannon so eloquently um, yeah. commented, um, this is a project that we have uh, had uh, on our radar for about 20 years. It was part of the plan development plan that was approved by all of you in 2003. Um, there was a much more elaborate plan, so this is a little scaled back from that, but um, this is the perfect timing for us to do this with yeah. the, um, the beautiful uh, Hacienda um, Senior Living Community that has now there. This is literally the front door of their um, community, and so it would be a wonderful area for them to be able to uh, 
stroll the grounds of the Mission San Luis Rey Lavanderia. Um, this is a really an amazing historic site, one of my favorite places at the mission. Um, this was the first place um, in the United States where aqueducts brought water from the San Luis Rey River to the Lavanderia. Uh, there's water filtration systems. It's just an amazing um, archaeological and educational area. It's a great place where we take our fourth graders. We have about 8,000 fourth graders that come to the mission every year. And so they learn a lot about eco ecology and conservation and, and how it's been done for centuries. Um, so it's a wonderful area that we, um, we really feel like it needs a lot of love right now. And so uh, it's a perfect time for us with, um, again, with the Hacienda Group here. And also we have funding for this project now. And so we're excited about it. Um, as Shannon mentioned, we have the, the, support, the support of the Luceno tribe. And um, so I hope that you will uh, consider and approve this. Any questions? Not right now. Thank okay. you very much for that presentation. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Uh, this is the time for the public to speak on, on this um, specific item. Do we have any uh, requests, written requests to speak? We have one written request to speak from Jimmy Knott. Mr. Knott. Oh, pass. Okay. Pass. Okay. All right. Um, any anyone wishing to speak on this item from the public? Okay, I see no one rising. So back to the council, and this is um, for adoption of a resolution. Okay. There's a motion. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion approved. Five zero. Thank you very much. Okay, next item is item number 24, and this is adoption of a resolution approving submission of the 2024-2025 Public Housing Agency Annual Plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development with the inclusion of changes made to the PHA Annual Plan as a result of public comments and authorize the CDC chair or designee to execute any and all related documents for submittal. I'd like to go ahead and open this public hearing and ask uh, the um, constituents, excuse me, commissioners for to report any or disclose any um, constituent contacts and or correspondence. Staff, and we had the initial uh, item, I think, a month ago. Same. The staff and uh, I believe so, a couple of comments. Staff and consistent. Constituents. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Do we have any correspondence and or petitions? Uh, we, have not had, we have not had any correspondence or petitions on this item. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and begin with um, Raymond Roll, our Housing Program Manager. Hi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and honor Honorable Commissioners. My name is Raymond Roll, and I'm the Housing Program Manager with the Housing and Neighborhood Services Department. I'm bringing before you the public Housing Authority Plan for fiscal year 24-25 for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. As background, uh, HUD requires us to provide a five-year plan that describes the PHA's mission goals and objectives and strategies for addressing the low-income housing needs in its jurisdiction. HUD additionally requires that PHAs supplement the five-year plan with an annual plan that reports the progress of meeting the five-year plan goals and describes any changes to policies and procedures. The, P the annual plan was presented and reviewed by the Resident Advisory Board on January 29th, 2024, the Housing Commission on February 27th, and made available for the required 45-day review and comment pre period beginning on February 25th and concluding with tonight's public hearing before the Community Development Commission. In the annual plan, we had one revision to operation and management, and that was when we transitioned the supervising housing specialist position to management analyst. Our uh, supervising housing specialist retired in, in December, and we believe that this was an opportunity to create a new role that provides more flexibility to the department to not only supervise staff, but also engage in more intricate administrative and analytical tasks that, ma that match the increasing complexity of the ever-changing local, state, and federal housing rules and regulations. Recruitment is currently underway for that position. 
for new activities, we provided an update on our project-based vouchers. Uh, project-based vouchers are rental assistance that's tied to a unit and not a household. And currently, the Oceanside Housing Authority has 109 project-based vouchers in its portfolio. We have the capacity to take on 20%. Currently, 50 project-based vouchers are administered, and 59 additional PBVs are coming on board when Greenbrier Village leases up in the summer. On February 9th, 2024, the Housing Authority published a notice of funding availability to award PBVs, including Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing Designated vouchers to newly constructed housing. That NOFA closed on March 22nd, and we received five proposals that we're currently reviewing. We also provided an update on our goals. Goal one in the five-year plan is to expand the supply of assisted housing. And we provided that progress with, we, our progress in that goal was through our emergency housing voucher program, which, which the housing authority was awarded 43 EHVs, EHV vouchers, which were issued during the COVID period. The allocation was to assist individuals and families who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. The deadline to utilize those vouchers was September 30th, 2023. The PHA, with the assistance of, part of our partnerships with other social service organizations, was able to fully utilize the EHV allocation by the deadline. An additional goal that we provided an update on was improving voucher management. And that was through the Section 8 Management Assessment Program, which is a self-assessment that is required by HUD to do on an annual basis. We look at 14 indicators through the CMAP uh, assessment. The, the CMAP was waived for three fiscal years during COVID era. Uh, and for fiscal year 28, 2018, 2019, the Housing Authority was deemed a standard performer. When we conducted the assessment for fiscal year 22, 23, we garnered a high performer rating. And I believe that's just a testament to the dedication and diligence of our housing staff. And the third goal that we provided an update on was promoting self-sufficiency of assisted households. In December 2023, the Housing Authority was awarded renewal funding for its family self-sufficiency self program to fund the FSS service coordinator position, which enables the PHA to continue the important work with HUD-assisted residents as they, become, as they move from government assistance. The recommendation is that the Oceanside Community Development Commission adopt the resolution approving submission to the of the 24-25 Public Housing Agency Annual Plan to HUD with the inclusion of any changes made to the PHA plan as a result of public comments and authorize the CDC chairman or designee to execute any and all related documents for submittal. This concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a public hearing. I believe we have received public comment before, right? And we would receive public comment again today. Okay, thank you. So this is the time for the public to comment on this item. Uh, do we have any uh, former requests to speak? Uh, yes, we do. One from Jimmy Knott. Thank you, Mr. Knott. Mayor, council members, give me that 127 Sherry Lane, Los Salido Momo homeowners, representative. I want to take and bring up an issue that I think needs to be addressed, and that is especially in any plan that our city develops. And that is protection for our mobile home park owners, especially those who are low income and dependent on single source income, like Social Security, because this puts them especially at risk for homelessness. And I, what I specifically point to is the potential conversion of mobile home parks. Right now, we have one park that is severely at risk of mobile home park convergence. 
one of the parks, the largest park, one of the largest parks in our city is that is at risk. And we have no real contingency for handling that and no plan within our any plans. Because as an example, in the recent past, we had a mobile home park that closed without any notice to the city. And guess what their fine was? $100. That's all. That's all that the, the company had to pay, $100, because of the state regulations. The city had no other reinforcing regulations that would make it pinch to help protect those people in that park. <clears throat> and I can go down story after story after story of needed protections. It's like the city had deaf ears. The city had very little heart. We need to open our ears. We need to open our hearts. And we need to take and have contingency plans to help these homeowners who are vulnerable. I'm not talking about those that have like three or four retirements or have millions of dollars in the bank that could buy out their mobile home park. I'm talking about those needy citizens. If something can be developed so that they can be protected and be put on that list, to be put up, let's say, higher on Section 8, saying, if anything happens, you will be put at the top. And thank, given that resource... Thank you, Mr. Knott. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. If you wish to address this item, please um, approach the podium and state your first name, and or state your name, and then you have up to three minutes. I see, yes, would you like to speak? Come on up. Good evening, Council and Mayor. My name's Wendy Bravo Dolan, and uh, I reside at Terrace Gardens Mobile Home Park. Uh, I know of uh, rentals there where the water freely leaks through the roof uh, onto the floor and the carpet has just been replaced and the subflooring has been compromised. Uh, there are, there's food insecurity present. Uh, there are those uh, who have uh, mental health issues uh, and other sorts of things uh, who are going to be utterly without resort if uh, something like that should occur at Terrace Gardens, as is uh, at Rancho San Luis Rey, where they're sorting things out, trying to figure out what can happen. The uh, uh, notion that uh, just simply to uh, go and uh, get on Section 8 is unfeasible uh, due to the length of time. These are the seniors that worked in our communities, in our community here in Oceanside, that served in our military uh, and uh, led, uh, you know, uh, productive lives. I, I don't feel like I should have to uh, adjust the, or uh, say d justify the dignity of human life and how much money you made over the course of your years. But uh, uh, I would, I would appeal to to uh, the municipality here to make room in its heart uh, to do the right thing by these folks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I see no one else standing, so I'll go ahead and close this part of the public hearing. And um, did you want to uh, address, does the staff want to address some of the comments that were made before we go to the council? I have a quick comment, if I could. Uh, yeah, there are. There was a comment made that the city has no regulations yeah. regarding the conversion of right. mobile home parks, which is not true. We have... Right very detailed regulations set forth in Article 34 of the Zoning Ordinance, as well as the provisions of the Mobile Home Residency Law that have recently been amended to increase uh, relocation uh, benefits to residents. So we do have laws in place. And we've, right, we've, uh, we've been through that before with at least one park here. I'm not familiar with the park he's referring to. I'll have to there speak was with not. Them. I think there was an RV and there was notice given and there were actually agreements between the homeowners and the uh, and the park. Did Ms. Leilani, Ms. Hines, did you want to speak? 
Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the report that's before you today is a very uh, standard report. It's yes. a report that we're required to provide in, a, in the format that's given to us by HUD. The issues that both the public speakers did speak on, of course, um, we are looking at through other measures and other planning efforts. So we are taking those comments into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, and I believe there's going to be, there's a plan to do a presentation about, uh, again, I guess, about the, uh, um, the safeguards regarding park closures. Yes, that is correct. Uh, we are slated to be at Rancho San Luis Rey to provide a presentation um, on the ordinance and any conversion efforts. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm gonna go, go ahead and um, bring this back to the council. Council Member Joyce. Just a question about uh, page three where it said the new activities. So we have uh, capa max capacity at 290 PVVs um, and we're currently utilizing 109, is that right? Yes. Okay, and so what, can you explain a little bit more in layman's terms about what we can, what that means for our well, situation? Sure. Um, the fact that it's only 109 doesn't necessarily mean we're not using them all. We're using them as housing choice vouchers, which is uh, where it's with the household and not necessarily with a unit. Um, that's something that require. Uh, th that's something that we've done. I guess a couple months ago, February, uh, we issued a NOFA trying to see if we can increase our allocation of project-based vouchers. Uh, we received five uh, responses to the NOFA, and hopefully we have a successful candidate where we can increase that number. Okay. okay. Thank you. No more questions. Council Member Weiss. Move approval staff recommendation. Thank you. We have a motion to adopt the resolution and a second. No other comments. Please vote. Motion approved, 5-0. Thank you. We are now on item number 25, uh, last public hearing, which is adoption of a resolution amending the implementing document of the local coastal program to incorporate revisions to the inclusionary housing ordinance, that's chapter 14C of the Oceanside City Code, and requesting California Coastal Commission certification of said amendment. I'd like to go ahead and open this public hearing and request disclosures from council members regarding constituent contacts and correspondence. Staff and public. Staff and public. Uh, same. Staff and then the public through the process. Staff, public. For. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Navarro, do we have any correspondence and or petitions? Uh, we have not received any correspondence or petition on this item. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and begin with uh, Ms. Lilani Hines, our Housing and Neighborhood Services Director. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, and the public here this evening. This action represents, I think, the final step in the adoption have some revisions that we have made to Chapter 14C, our inclusionary housing ordinance of the City of Oceanside City Code. So tonight, staff is recommending that the City Council adopt a resolution amending the implementing document of the coast, local coastal program to incorporate those revisions that you approved back in January um, to our inclusionary housing ordinance, and then requesting that the California Coastal Commission certify this amendment. So back in January, the City Council did adopt an ordinance that amended our inclusionary housing policy, which increased our affordable housing requirement from 10% to 15% citywide. It raised the project threshold from three dwelling units to 10 dwelling units, uh, required the proportionate unit mix, dispersal of units, and access to amenities throughout to affirmatively further fair housing, and then just clarified the use of ADUs as an alternative for our single family residential uh, development project. At that point in time, these revisions only apply to those areas of the city located outside of the coastal zone. Tonight's resolution would have the effect of really applying those amendments to all properties within the coastal zone. So with that, Staff is recommending that the council adopt the resolution so that we can amend our local coastal program to incorporate these revisions and then take the follow-up action with the California Coastal Commission in requesting their certification. That concludes staff's presentation this evening and we're available to answer any questions. 
Thank you very much. This is a time for the public to um, provide their input on this specific item. Do we have any formal requests to speak on this item? We have four registered speakers. Our first speaker is Tom DeMoy, to be followed by Jimmy Knott, to be followed by Patty Kay. Hey, good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Yeah, I encourage you guys to adopt this resolution. It, <laughs> residential developments of three or more to increase the 10 units, that's a good thing. It's a uh, household 10% to 15%. That's not gonna make a difference in uh, uh, development. This will not change or deter development in investing in Oceanside and anything uh, to help the low and moderate income families in Oceanside. We're all neighbors, we all love each other, we all live in uh, Oceanside, and if this is to help some low and moderate neighbors that we embrace, it's a good thing. And uh, I'm glad you voted for uh, item number 24. And that's it. I just hope you uh, adopt this resolution. You have a nice evening. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Uh, Mr. Knott, followed by Patty Kay. Mayor, Council Members, Jim Knott, 127 Cherry Lane. I will support this, even though I know that this is sort of a weak support. I also would encourage you to look at what the realities are of what low income means. And I would encourage you to look at minimum social security and minimum military retirement. If it doesn't match that, that's not low income. That's some point way up here. Down here is reality. I encourage you to look at reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Patty Kay, followed by Richard Newton. Good evening. Thank you. This is a good discussion because I think there are some misconceptions, and I think you've read my notes, but I will uh, adapt them a little bit. Uh, let's look at the overall picture, and the overall picture shows the downtown is going to be mass density whereas the rest of the city is not. This is not, in your terms, equitable to those that live down there. Uh, the development does not benefit the low income. It's a drop in the bucket, okay? It does not benefit the workforce housing that we're all asking for. Uh, it's, uh, they, they cannot afford three and $4,000 for a one-bedroom house uh, when you have a family and no yard. This, who does this benefit? This benefits the extra bonus density, the extra units, the extra um, uh, floors that are added with the bonus density and, then, and the lack of setbacks. It, it benefits the developer. And I'm just wondering if down the line, when you have a few of those low-income people in there, if when the rents go up, I mean, they have to go up eventually, if the city will not be subsidizing some more of their rent, okay? Uh, the, in the coastal zone, developers have already abused the local residents with their monster developments. The point is, we're not against, we are for low-income housing, we are for workforce housing. These developments, especially downtown, do not provide that or in most of the, you're being sold low income housing and it is not. It's a drop in the bucket when you have 365 units and maybe 30 are low income or, or and the rest of the workforce housing cannot afford those. You're bringing in out of town people that can afford to live two blocks to the beach. You're compounding the problem of the need for workforce housing in other areas of the city. We see the council of caving to the dictates of Sacramento and not fighting for the locals. On any vote, you must ask who does this favor? For one, it favors the developers. Does it also favor re-election? I, I think not. The locals can't even get to the downtown. So let's even it out. Let's be more equitable, equitable around the city with this development. We don't need more density. 
You already have the trains, transit station five blocks coming on. You have the one by the high, uh, the uh, Wyndham coming on. You have the Moderna coming on, and you have the one overlooking the harbor coming on. This is this is already dense enough down here. The congestion. How many live down here and fight for a parking spot or come down here? I mean, the restaurants and everything is nice, but the local it doesn't favor the locals. All of this development downtown does not favor the locals. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Richard Newton. Mayor Sanchez, members of the council and the public. This inclusionary, inclusionary housing shift from 10% to 15% goes back to last year's December 6th meeting when three Republicans first defeated a proposal advocated by the two Democrats on the council. The mayor, who lost, called for a break in the middle of that vote. Members went in the back, apparently to horse trade, out of public sight, and then worked out a bargain. Over the next, at uh, that meeting and over the next few council meetings, the Republican majority, majority gave away its position bit by bit until the two Democrats had been given even more than they had originally asked for. Never underestimate the ability of Republicans to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. So tonight, this item 25 extends that giveaway to the coastal zone, the only part of the city not affected by this Republican capitulation and surrender. But there are still three Republicans on this council. It is not too late to stand up for the proper principles of Republicanism, personal responsibility and achievement, economic freedom, and the reluctance to socialize economic opportunities. Please reject this item. Do not increase inclusionary housing beyond the state mandated 10%. Then use your majority to revisit and rescind the recent increases of affordable housing to 15% citywide that you previously passed. Let me be clear, housing is not a right. It is an economic transaction involving the exchange of money for a desired commodity. If you treat it as a right, you enslave other taxpayers and property owners to work for free to give housing to others. As I've said before, there is no right to live somewhere that you cannot afford. We are all free as Americans to relocate anywhere in the country where cost of living is lower than along the shores of the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a public hearing. You did not have to have um, formally signed up to speak on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please approach the podium. I see no one else rising, so I'm going to go ahead and close this uh, portion of the public hearing. Um, go to staff to see if there's any response to any of the comments. Oh, Mr. Mullen, would you like to start? No, not unless there's a question, sorry. Okay. So the action before you tonight is just to provide um, the same types of requirements that we have already in other areas of the community to the coastal zone area. As we discussed with the tenant protections, there is a great need for more affordable housing. Uh, this is this becomes the deed restricted affordable housing uh, whereby rents are restricted and they're restricted for over a 55 year period. So offers a lot of stability for our residents at affordable rates uh, to be included all throughout the community, whether it's in the coastal area or in other parts of the community. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, gonna go ahead and move adoption. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, did you want to speak further? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Councilor Joyce. I heard density brought up. Did, did we take an action on density in the downtown area? And it, what's the status of that if staff has an update? There's your question, Mr. Mullen. Well, you did take an action to uh, cap density, uh, 86 dwelling units to the acre. Um, I'll have to defer as to what the status of the LCP amendment is. Uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I do know that the LCP has been submitted to the Coastal Commission immediately following your action to approve it. So it's in their court right now to review it and uh, see what they're gonna do with it, whether or not they allow us to proceed as you adopted or if they're gonna be recommending further changes, but it is in the Coastal Commission's hands at this point in time. Do we have any indication um, about what they'll do with this uh, local coastal program amendment? Has there been any conversation ahead of this? No? Uh, honorable Mayor doesn't, our Mayor and Council members, no, it doesn't sound like it. Okay. 
Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. Motion approved, 401. Kime, no. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and go back to our general items. Um, go back to item number 20. I believe Ms. Hines had just completed um, her presentation. And we are at uh, public speakers. So we have three. Is that correct? That is correct. Our first speaker is Jimmy Knott to be followed by Michael Richardson, to be followed by Richard Newton. Mayor, Council, Jimmy Knott 127, Sherry Lane. Being a homeowner's representative, I get some questions at time. And mainly it's broken down in two groups besides homeowners, and that is renters in the park of either the park owner or other homeowners who have decided to buy an additional mobile and try to get additional funding, let's say, for the retirement. And then there's outside people of, of the park that own rental spaces that, don't, that know that we have rent control. And for the set that, I appreciate that. And I wanted to thank the city for establishing rent control for the manufactured home community. If it wasn't for that, we would be like our near city, Carlsbad, paying untold thousands of dollars that would be unwarranted. So the thing is, is this a protecting system. And essentially, this is what the proposal that's coming forward does, is that it puts a, a, the steam pot is boiling. It puts a governor on it saying, let's put reasonable levels. Let's not let things blow up. So what happens is, is that I would encourage you that if even there is a funding question, copy. 16B, let the beneficiaries help pay for enforcement of the rent control that they would benefit from. That way that you won't have to pay it, it would be on the burden of those who receive the benefit. And maybe consider an application that could extend the application for the renters within the mobile home community that do not qualify because we as a charter city have that power. So I would submit that to you, that you would have the ability to go a step beyond because we are a charter city. And the only thing I would point out is that the problem is with disaster relocation and reconstruction issues that the city of San Diego has found with their ordinance down there that they're having to catch up on. And that's one thing that we may want to look. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Richardson, followed by Richard Newton. Good, good evening. I, I want to commend uh, Ms. Hines for asking for funds to, uh, to uh, educate tenants on their rights. Somewhere in the presentation, she did say responsibilities. But on the final request, she didn't mention responsibilities. I think it's uh, important to make the emphasis on uh, tenant rights and tenants' responsibilities uh, equal. Um, I believe personally that many, many, if not most, tenant, uh, landlord disputes happen because the tenants didn't understand that they were uh, taking someone's prized property and expected to take care of it. <clears throat> you know, according to her, I think it was 43%, uh, is that right, of the city's housing stock is rentals? That means uh, thousands of people have saved nickels and dimes and 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 say and worked hard 
to invest in a rental property and you know with the intent of of turning it over to someone else it's a bit like to me it's a bit like turning your child over to a babysitter you expect them to take uh, excellent care of it and when they don't you, you have a dispute so i i would ask that you add tenant responsibilities to that request for uh, education of tenants because i think that's where the, uh, the problem lies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Newton? Mayor Sanchez, members of the council and the public, um, when uh, Lelani Hines the staff, made the staff presentation, she mentioned tenants' rights and landlord responsibilities. I noticed she didn't mention tenant responsibilities and landlord's rights. Sort of a paternalistic dynamic. A landlord has his or her life, and save, life savings invested in those properties. They should have rights. And they should, when they enter into contracts, expect the other party of that contract, the counterparty, to have certain responsibilities. A rental contract is a contract between two responsible adults. It is not a parent-child relationship. Property ownership is the first step for most people to acquire personal wealth. That includes people who are currently tenants. Most of us started off as tenants when we were younger, went to college, we eventually succeeded, bought property, and that was a tailwind to our personal wealth. Everybody can follow that path. That helps all Americans eventually as they age and progress through life and their careers. It follows the property rights are an important component of the value of that property and the benefits of ownership. By limiting or restricting use, regulations strip wealth from the property owners. That holds down the financial growth of the young and hardworking property owners. The goal instead should be to teach people to become financially successful so they too may become property owners themselves, not giving them subsidized rent. In a free society, there should be a right to acquire and accumulate wealth through property ownership. Government regulations should not strip people of that opportunity. Property owners should be largely free to enter an arm length contra arm's length contract and both parties should then be held to the terms of those contracts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone? There's no one else, right? Okay. So uh, back to the council, Council Member Joyce. Thank you. I just had a couple questions before we go into conversation. So, um, I'll, I'll go into what we just heard about first, actually. How do, um, how do tenants find out about their protections under the protection ordinance, under the 2019 and the new one? How do they find out in general? How would Johnny Q Renter <laughs> get clued in? Absolutely. So we do publicize all of this information on the Housing Department website. If folks know how to navigate and get to our website, we do provide this information at our community resource centers. We actually have um, the state's Department of Consumer Affairs publishes the California tenant and landlord rights and responsibilities on both parts. Uh, we have that actually at our community resources centers, available in both English and Spanish for folks who are looking to find more information and to guide them. Um, and then we advertise this through our social media accounts. We advertise it in our resource centers. And so the action that we're requesting is to expand those efforts and to really look um, at a much more uh, public facing component, because again, you don't know what you don't know. For example, um, the day of the child event at Balderrama Park, we will have CSA San Diego at that event as a, as a, at a booth with a breakout session at 2.30 p.m. where folks can go and get educated and learn more about tenant rights and responsibilities with CSA at that event. And so those are some of the activities we're doing now to educate folks, and then we hope to be able to offer a more expansive program. Okay. And how do tenants find out about their responsibilities to a landlord? So that can be through the education, again, the, the 
book that I look at is that State Department of Consumer Affairs book. It provides all that information on both the actions of a tenant and their responsibilities to a property owner, okay. I, as well I'm as I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be running out of time, so I'm just going okay. to real quick. It's also in the lease, right? Like this, the lease that they sign generally has their responsibilities to what Absolutely, they have to the do. Absolutely, the lease terms And too. it's like a multi, multi, multi-page thing. It's like yes. this, this is the thing you can't do. You can't Absolutely. You know, drink water out of this thing. You can't paint this thing. So those are like a big outline of responsibilities. They have to sign that before they even occupy the unit usually? That's correct. Okay. So they're, they're pretty well aware of their responsibilities despite what we've heard. Um, can you tell me what, uh, and I'm sorry again briefly because there's a lot to this, what education would look like with the money that is proposed to, to happen here? I think education would look like a little bit more than just offering it on websites. Um, it would be going out to the public and really reaching out to them, door to, not necessarily door to door, but offering them opportunities at different, leveraging events where we can be, whether it's the farmer's market, our different social events, and offering um, public workshops, advertising them through our collaborations, working with the apartment association and their efforts to get information out. So you said, um I liked your first idea. Door to door sounds great, but maybe, maybe you know, maybe it's a good idea that we send out a, a flyer. Is that part of this allocation currently? Sure, we have talked about, and I think the report talked about, you know, uh, providing notices. So, for example, if there's an easy way to include it within um, an insert in utility billings, if that's possible, or any, we look to leverage opportunities that are already existing and to get that information out. It does become quite expensive and intensive to provide um, those direct types of efforts, whether it's door to door or mailers to over 20, 5,000 different renter households in the community. And if they're not aware, then they could very well be evicted uh, within violation of the rights because they just had no idea that they actually had these rights, theoretically. Theoretically, but our goal okay. is to get that information out to the public as soon as possible. It's just so a large group of people that you're trying to reach through, you know, Dia de Ninos and our website. Um, how do how do landlords enforce their rights when like a lease is violated or if they want their tenant out of the unit? How do they enforce those rights? Those, those rights are enforced through the court process and okay. through the eviction so process. So they can file a court, which we pay for. Um, and if the court says they should be out, who enforces that next step? That next step is then um, enforced by the sheriffs. Okay, so the sheriffs will then remove people from their house because, okay, so again, that's a like, publicly subsidized enforcement mechanism. Uh, how do tenants enforce their rights? These issues are civil matters between two private parties and they enforce their rights through the civil process or through the courts. All right. So they'd have to hire a lawyer, and we're talking about 30% of our, our renters are low, 30% uh, of all of our renters are very low income. They'd have to go hire a lawyer to fight for their rights on this. Um, okay. Did you have a question? A tenant has, or a landlord has Wait, to hire a lawyer me, as well. Excuse me, excuse so. me. He asked I'm me sorry. about a question. I, That's my apologies. Why don't we, did you, did you want to finish I'll take comments? a break if there are other comments. My apologies, Deputy, Deputy Mayor. Um, we do have Councilmember Robinson next, but. No, it's fine. Just, he asked me about a question. Thank you. A um, couple questions. Um, and one, I would say I printed off the, you know, people don't always have to go to our website and go to the state. Uh, anybody with a phone can put in tenant rights and it takes you almost right to this uh, Attorney General Bonta's uh, very succinct letter on what their rights are and how to access them. So it, it doesn't take a lot of uh, talent to get there. I found it. Um, but I do have a question. Need by that. Never mind. <laughs> Just 
being honest, give Mayor. it back thirty seconds. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. Um, I want to uh, on on page two of the report, and I'm just curious, and I and I probably should have asked you ahead of time. So, uh, under the analysis part, it talks about. Um, it says like 41% of the city's housing is rental housing, so almost 27,000 units. Then in the second paragraph, it says, of all Oceanside renters, it's estimated. How did these estimates, where did these come from? How, did, how, how were these numbers derived? These estimates are derived, as you see in the footnotes, from the American Community Survey, so they're five-year estimates. Okay, so I went... I looked at that. I also went to the HUD site. Yes. And as I start to navigate through that, it really did look at it. It says Oceanside Escondido. Are these numbers, these things reflective of only Oceanside or is this of a larger geographical region? No, those numbers should be Oceanside. I, I apologize. I, I can't not recall that data. So you're stating that you went to the HUD CHAS data and the HUD CHAS data provided. And the page that you go to, it, mm -hmm. it has a separate page for San Diego. And then when you look up Oceanside, it says Oceanside dash Escondido. And I'm just curious if this is a wider set of data than just Oceanside. I apologize, council member. I, I don't know the response to that question. Um, okay. Um, I guess that's all I had. Thanks. Uh, Deputy Mayor Kime. And I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Ms. Hines, but I mean, oftentimes, so say a tenant, um, for whatever reason, to stop, uh, decides to stop paying rent. How often, I mean, how long can these processes go on? It can take a very long time, six months, maybe even longer. And so who pays that landlord, that landlord's rent or, or, or a mortgage when that tenant decides just not to pay? Sure. Just like during the COVID times when we had eviction moratoriums, our landlords are out that rent for that period of time. Okay. And then when they try for six months to get someone who decides not to pay them for their house, and this could be maybe one or two rental properties, that's their, their main income that funds their first property, so it, I mean it um, could destroy their entire livelihood. So then when they finally get six months of no um, rent and then they have to go hire an attorney because they're going through the court and they're not lawyers, so they have to pay for that. Um, and then they go use the court system again to get them out. So I, I would offer the opposite to it, a, a subsidize for someone who doesn't want to pay rent and get them out of a um, uh, evict someone, so I think there's both sides to that. I just, um, I think we vilify um, landlords too much. We realize there's many mom and pop. We have many small, and there's landlords just like there's tenants that, um, um, you know, um, don't do the greatest job, but I think we vil you know, villainize landlords, especially small ones, um, and it makes it very difficult, and it discourages, I think it really discourages responsible homeowners from deciding to rent out their house, and it makes it easier for big corporate landlords to come in because they have attorneys on staff. They have a uh, mechanism in place to deal with these things. So I just think we need to be more thoughtful instead of just thinking it's evil landlords. Count <laughs> Councilmember Joyce. Director Hines, do most of these protections exempt small landlords? For the small, for the single family homes, it does. Okay. And most of the protections that we're talking about in Chula Vista and San Diego, they're not about people that weren't paying their rent. Is that correct? These are about no fault evictions. It covers both the at fault and the, the no Chula fault. Vista did? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, I would really like to see the education outreach plan uh, strengthened to provide a mailer to all apartments from the city informing tenants of their rights just because of the unreasonable way to find, to, for people to find out about these, this information. So um, that'd be my first request to my colleagues. Uh, 
The second request would be that we have signed notification of tenants' rights included in all new leases that go out. I don't, I guess I'd like to know if there's a reason the council wouldn't support this kind of simple action. We would design a flyer that outlines the tenants' rights. Again, this is not, this is not going against uh, people who are, are not paying their rent. This is about folks who are paying their rent and um, they're being asked to leave their home, which is one of the most disruptive actions that can happen to an individual's life, to children who are attending school, to seniors who are on fixed income. It's about making sure they understand their rights. We're not even expanding their rights. This is about making sure that people know the law. So that would be the second request. Is there any, is there any comments from my colleagues on that? Any reason that would be? Council Member Weiss. Are you talking about the brochure that's in attachment two? If you, if you send it over, I don't have the staff report up right this second. Did you want to continue, Councilmember Wise? Okay, Councilmember Robinson. Uh, I would. I don't have any big argument with you, Councilmember Joyce, on it, but I do think we're going to. No, I know. I, oh, go ahead. Thanks, Dad. No, I'm just kidding. You're welcome. You're welcome son. <laughs> Um, I, we're going to contract with CS. We have a contract. We're going to extend it. We're going to give them money to do it. They're, they know, let's give them a chance to come back and make recommendations or work with staff, it, you know, the, the best way to do this. Um, I, I really don't see the expending the cost to send a flyer when 90% of them are going to end up in the trash, not red. It doesn't make sense to me. That's all. I. I just know how what happens. Even if you were put it in billing statements, they end up in the trash. They so I would say let let's let our contractor come up with the best way, give them direction to uh, do that, the best outreach possible, and and leave it at that. Deputy Mayor Kime. Yeah, I I'm okay with staff's recommendation of. I'm adding a little bit to the contract uh, for more outreach. Also, um, with their recommendation to not do anything above and beyond the state, which is already um, very um, involved in this arena. So I'm going to go ahead and make a uh, motion to approve staff's recommendation. Second. Uh, Council Member Joyce. I'd like to offer an amendment to the motion that we reduce the time of applicability to no fault protections. Again, this is about people who are not doing anything wrong, that are being evicted through no fault of their own, that instead of making them live in the, the unit for a whole year before they actually receive the protection, the fair protection of the law, that we reduce that to a month. So one month in, they would, they would be given their rights. Would you accept the amendment? I'm going to reiterate my original, uh, original motion to, uh, for staff's recommendation. So you're denying the friendly amendment? Yeah, I, correct. I'm, making, um, I'm reiterating my original motion for staff's recommendation. Right. Feel free to, uh... So... Is it my turn back to talk? You, you, yeah, it's still your... <laughs> sorry. Tick, I'm tick. sorry, I, did, I should have stopped. <laughs> my, my bad. That's okay. So I guess I'll just take a minute to just talk about it. This is, uh, again, 30% of our households are very low income. That's over 18,000 households in the city. Last year, uh, over 470 of them were filed, were, were served with... Uh, unlawful retainer, which means they were forced to be evicted from their home. This is just a sliver because many, many more were told to leave and are, are leave their home before that eviction notice gets in because they don't want that on the record because then they're going to have to try and get another 
housing with a bad record, which makes it even harder. Um, the, the simple things I asked for were that we just make sure people know their rights. I feel like that's a frustrating bar to not hit. I'm not asking you to go beyond the state, although in many realms we find that we curse the state because they get into our business too much, but now we think they know best, so we'll let them just do their thing. Instead, instead, this is my turn, instead, we're going to just let it happen. We're just going to let another 500 families be evicted, some through no fault of their own once again, and it's not vilifying, it's not vilifying landlords. In fact, if we knew more, if we did some of the things that, we're requ that I'm requesting here, we would know more about the situation itself, and we'd find out, which most municipalities find out, that there's only a few that tend to be the bad actors. But we don't even know that because we're not even asking the question. Deputy Mayor Kime. So this is a, a really, really um, critical time in the city of Oceanside. As someone who's lived here for most of my life, um, I've never seen the vacancy rate so low. This is what is really causing um, the situation um, to be the way it is now. Uh, we um, did outline several uh, and, and, and together as a council pass several um, items um, in the toolbox. We, one thing that we um, are also gonna be doing is building more housing. Uh, can't come quick enough, uh, but this is a housing crisis right now. And um, these law, this, the law from the state just became um, active as of April 1st. We haven't really seen um, what the impacts are. Uh, um, Ms. Hines, I trust that you will find, you're very creative, find different ways of getting the information out. This is about educating our public. Um, and uh, I, don't know the, I don't know if the water bill would really get to the right people. Um, I don't, you know, I think it really goes to the landlords still. Um, although some people are, some landlords are requiring their tenants to pay the water bill. Um, so, you know, I know that you'll come up with things. Um, please, I would, in, I would invite you to um, let us know if you need more assistance in getting that information out. Um, you know, I, I really would like to see that. I think we all would like to see that. Uh, Council Member Robinson. Thanks, Mayor. Last comment for me is I, I think it's also important to note that the state has other uh, bills coming down, things that are going to um, cap security deposits. There's another, right. uh, I don't know if it's assembly bill or senate bill about pets that uh, a, a landlord won't be able to say no to somebody that has a, they have a term for it, normal household pet or something like that. Um, that's going to happen. Uh, I think there, there's a lot of things that are changing to benefit uh, renters and um, um, I won't say penalize uh, landlords, but make make being a landlord a little more uh, tenuous. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I did want to um, also comment that as to page two, where it talks about the median Oceanside rent, my understanding from talking to, and I, and I mentioned this to Ms. Hines, that um, in speaking to um, uh, folks who are looking for a place and also folks who are trying to provide a place, it's, it's, the median is not 2,500, it's actually 3,500. So 3,000 to 3,500 for a two bedroom. So th this is you know, even more critical than um, in Oceanside. I'm talking just Oceanside. Um, I think because we are a coastal city, um, maybe the rents are a little lower in, in say Escondido but in Oceanside, things are really critical. There is a motion on the, on the floor. Um, please vote. Motion approved, 4-1, Joyce Snow. 
Thank you very much. Item number 21, I know we have some folks waiting for this one, is introduction of an ordinance to amend Chapter 39, Light Pollution Regulations of the Oceanside City Code to establish outdoor lighting standards applicable to residential dwellings and multifamily developments with three or less units. Um, we have a report by Rob Demahowski. Was that better, um, Mr. Principal Planner? Okay, thank you. Right, I'm going to get it one of these days. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Rob Demahowski with the Planning Division. And this item is a request to introduce an ordinance to amend Chapter 39, Light Pollution Regulations of the City Code to establish outdoor lighting standards for residential dwellings and multifamily units with three or less units. Article 39 of the City Code was originally established in 1991 to restrict light emissions into the night sky and generally applies to new commercial, industrial, public, semi-public, and multi-family developments with more than three units. Residential dwellings such as single-family residences and multi-family projects with three or less units are currently exempt from the light ordinance. The lack of basic regulations has resulted in periodic light nuisance complaints and enforcement issues in neighborhoods. To address nuisance complaints, staff is recommending um, amendments to Chapter 39 to establish basic requirements for residential light fixtures to prevent light trespass, define light trespass for implementation and enforcement, and third, remove light exemptions for residential dwellings and small multifamily developments. The proposed text amendments will add the following requirements. Residential dwellings shall maintain light fixtures to prevent light trespass on adjacent properties. Light fixtures shall be shielded or angled below the horizontal plane of the light fixture to avoid direct illumination beyond the property line in which it is located. And security lighting, landscape, and accent lighting that is properly directed to avoid light trespass may operate at all hours. Lighting that does not produce light trespass shall be considered a nuisance and in violation of the code. And light trespass shall be defined as light that is emitted by an outdoor lighting fixture, security lighting, landscape lighting, or architectural accent lighting that directly illum illuminates beyond the property on which the fixture is installed. Residential dwellings will only be subject to the provisions added by this amendment and the enforcement section of chapter 39. And last, the, the section exempting residential homes and small multifamily projects will be deleted. And for reference, the illustration demonstrates the difference between a light fixture installed under the proposed revisions versus an unshielded light fixture causing light trespass on adjacent properties. Residential light fixtures are necessary for a variety of reasons, including safety, security, and aesthetics. When lighting is improperly installed, it can cause a light spillage and glare on neighboring properties, resulting in a nuisance. The proposed amendments would establish reasonable light requirements for residential properties to avoid light trespass without restricting the ability to install lighting for such purposes as security or safety. The regulations will also allow code enforcement to identify and enforce light nuisance complaints. Therefore, staff recommends that the City Council introduce an ordinance to amend Chapter 39 of the City Code to establish outdoor lighting standards for residential dwellings and multi-family developments with three or less units. Thank you. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, hear from the public at this point? We have three speakers under item number 21. Thank you. Um, our first speaker is Michelle Donez, to be followed by Wendy Bravo, to be followed by Jimmy Knott. Um, my name is Michelle Donez. This is my husband, Adrian. We live at 1024 South Clementine. 
We have owned and lived in our property for 25 years. And 74 days ago, our neighbors did this. And I don't know that there's a whole lot that needs to be said other than the fact that no one should be able to have this kind of negative effect on a neighborhood, because it sucks. That's what I got. Thank you, Ms. Domez. Ms. Bravo, followed by Jimmy Knott. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, if somebody could come down on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, this is the uh, Eddie Jones Manufacturing and Distribution Warehouse facility uh, this under is, consideration by uh, Planning Division right now. This is uh, about the lighting ordinance? I, I understand that, okay. uh, Mayor Sanchez, and I'm leading up to it, but I don't okay. want to use up time uh, with that. Thank uh, you. This is the proximity of the Abbey there, which houses... Uh, uh, some 21 men. Um, I don't know if that's considered a residential dwelling or not, but it's certainly uh, church grounds. And the light that's going to be uh, planned for this area is not going to be taken care of by angle down housing. This is going to cause an illumination up through the airport community and easily visible within that 1,500 feet and above it uh, as uh, disturbing to the uh, uh, quiet the uh, enjoyment of uh, spiritual life at nighttime and prayer and uh, also uh, for those who live in the airport community I, I'm wondering uh, if this doesn't also you know constitute we'll say uh, you know uh, light pollution uh, certainly uh, in terms of CEQA that's something that's uh, accounted for and uh, should be contained in the uh, draft environmental report currently before them in terms of aesthetics and uh, our beautiful unsullied uh, uh, riparian habitat. Uh, down here are several preserves uh, that are within the scope of this project here, particularly as you'll see here, that's the Eddie Jones project. And then of course we have a lot of industrial lights spilling up through the area in through here. So I would ask that uh, the council consider this uh, proposition in with also within the context of what's occurring uh, along our landscape and uh, housing areas that are uh, extant, including church grounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Knott? Yes, Mayor, Council Members, Jimmy Knott, 127 Cherry Lane. As you know, into our mobile home parks, we had our lighting established way back in the 50s and 60s. And the problem with that is just for your notice uh, with your standards that you're proposing to establish now. The problem is that the, those standards are frozen. And so what happens is when the AARP came out with a study to help guide communities for senior living and what is beneficial for the eyes as we age, and I notice all of you up here are maybe a little bit older than 40 years, I would judge that. Um, I think that this and our senior mobile home communities are lacking with standards that fit the AARP standard. But we're not allowed to change that. They're not allowed to be sanctioned because they're frozen. I encourage you to follow the AARP standards with illumination standards and lumens per foot so that the, the people can judge it and have a scientific methodology. And also, you have to take in consideration these days for motion sensors. I did not see that. Another thing that should be considered as well is our own city lights. How far of illumination or palavra is extended out? Is it really being complied with? Occasionally, I've gone to communities where this all sink a little bit. So I would encourage you to look at this a little bit and make accommodation for our seniors, 
and for those who may have a certain aging eye standards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Weiss. I have a question for staff. What happens at Christmas time? <laughs> Mayor Sanchez, Council Member Weiss, holiday and seasonal lights are exempt from the provisions of the, the light ordinance. There is a, a section that will be unaffected by, by this amendment. So we can still do the tree lighting? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move introduction. There's a motion and a second. Council Member Robinson? Thank you. Just a quick question. Is there anything in the ordinance that actually specifies the lumens or wattage of light? Like on my house, do I have to, does it say I can't have a certain, it just has to be shielded, correct? Council Member Robinson, that is correct. There are no specific standards for the residential lighting. I assume there, there would be requirements under, under the uh, building code for acceptable lighting, but there are no uh, restrictions for, uh, for single family dwellings or, or uh, less than three units multifamily. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Joyce. I do worry a little bit that um, a seasonal or a holiday excuse might allow for bad actors to make bad choices, but um, um, I support it and I want to apologize to the neighbors that have had to deal with it for so long. Uh, Mr. Mullen titled the ordinance. This is the introduction of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside amending Chapter 39 of the Oceanside City Code to establish outdoor lighting standards for residential dwellings and multifamily dwellings with three or less units. Thank you. Please vote. Motion approved, 5 0. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. What was that? That's the introduction. We have to do the adoption, right? And then we have to have 30 days. So. Just wanted them to know. Yeah. But at least it's finally on the. Getting on the books. Thank you very much for all coming. Thank you for your support in coming up with a resolution. Thank you. Um, so we're now we're on um, under item number 26, which is advanced written request to reserve time to speak. Um, under A, Ken Layton. Mayor Sanchez and Councilman Ken Layton speaking for myself. Over the weekend, I got a call from a pollster asking my thoughts on short-term rentals. It was obvious who paid for the poll, but it shows they know that residents are pissed. And if they get informed and become motivated to save their neighborhood, the city council might react to the blight of short-term rentals. Not sure exactly what the council aides do or why they get paid twice as much as the city council members uh, they work for, but I implore Council Member Kime, who I hope cares what his constituents think, to have his aide ask the neighborhood surrounding 1473 boroughs about what they think of the party central compound Acutely nicknamed Casa de Kona. It's a massive Ken and Barbie funhouse where out of town party people invade South O with late night noise and an overnight parking menagerie overwhelming this South O neighborhood all year round. According to all the neighbors who weighed in on social media, this house is a public nuisance. Please poll them, Mr. Kime. Excuse me. Please poll them, Mr. Kime. Show us that you care about that neighborhood. They don't want to burden police or those neighbors don't want to burden police or code enforcement at 2 a.m. They simply want the council to reverse the trend where you allowed Oceanside 
more than any other city in the county to be overwhelmed with these funhouse hotels. 1473 Burroughs shows the STR issue is not just about rich people on the beach. The word is out. Dr. Frankenstein, or I mean uh, Fishbach, created a city government monster that hands over, that bends over backwards and forwards for out of town investors, ruining neighborhoods zoned resident only. The Casa de Kona guy is only cashing in on the massive loophole provided to him by the city. From the only an Oceanside file, for your consideration, the planning department twilight zone. In December, this body directed city staff to come back with an ordinance that would stop any future STRs in neighborhoods zoned resident only. Instead, the planning staff came before the planning commission last month thumbing its nose at the city council and said, we want you to instead endorse this ordinance that allows 50 more STRs, completely ignoring what the council directed it to do. The planning commission did say, uh, no thank you. But this massive public FU to the council underscores the fact that the tail is wagging the dog. It appears that the city of Oceanside has become so addicted to that sweet transit occupancy tax money that it will openly ignore city council direction. Who's running this show? Why do we even have city council elections? While it's clear to me that it took campaign contributions to make at least one council member sit up and pay attention to this STR scourge, at least it's good to know something can get you to see the light. Now it's time for the joke of the day. Oceanside short-term rental lobby says the pro-neighborhood folks are led by out-of-town billionaire bullies. Our STR industrial complex was created by campaign cash honeypot David Fishbach, who lives in Rancho Santa Fe. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Anna Maria Hallman. Good evening, Council. I'm Anna Maria. I live in District 3. I'm here again to implore you to use your power and privilege as our Oceanside Council members to put forth on the agenda a call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. But before I get into that, I want to address what I see as one of the many layers of Islamophobia that have led to this ethnic cleansing in Gaza, and that is the systemic ignorance about Arab and Muslim culture. I've been monitoring the city of Oceanside's official Instagram page and have yet to see a mention of any Arab-related celebrations, religious, or cultural events. I have seen posts about Dia de Muertos, Merry Christmas, National Law Enforcement Day, to a post recently wishing everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. Yet, I have not seen anything about Ramadan. Ramadan is the holy month for Muslims, and it's observed by at least 1.8 billion people globally, that's about 25% of the human population. In fact, today is Eid, the festival of breaking the fast, which is celebrated at the end of the fasting month of Ramadan by Muslims worldwide, including those in Oceanside. Take this deliberate ignorance about Arabs and Muslims and add to it the trauma that displaced Palestinians have had to live through for generations, and it is clear that emotions are high for the Palestinian community which is why it is of utmost importance to have empathy when engaging with members of the Palestinian diaspora. This is why at the last city council meeting, I was extremely upset when Mayor Sanchez refused to listen to one of our Palestinian residents and walked out of the chambers, supposedly due to the break in agenda protocol. While I can appreciate that there is some law which enforces the rule that at 6 p.m. 
Only comments made on agenda items are allowed. I can't appreciate the mayor's disrespect and lack of empathy, nor the Oceanside government's discrimination of our Muslim neighbors. If there wasn't such widespread ignorance and lack of education about the Arab community in Oceanside, then perhaps during Ramadan, there could be an amendment to the law to make the city council meetings accessible to those who are fasting and need to get home by a specific time to break the fast with their families. Now, onto the matter at hand. Israel is committing war crimes and breaking international law. In December, Nadine Sayeg, a journalist at the Institute for Palestine Studies, released a non-exhaustive analysis on Israeli war crimes since October 7th. These include genocide, intentional harm of protected persons, violation of treaties regarding vulnerable individuals, disproportionate response, forced displacement and land annexation, perfidy, desecration and mutilation of corpses, desecration of cultural property, denying humanitarian aid, food, and medical supplies, battle testing, eco-terrorism, child prisoners, torture, and more. In 2017, UNESCO released a policy guide called Education About the Holocaust and Preventing Genocide. The guide states that Holocaust education, quote, provides a starting point to examine warning signs that can indicate the potential for mass atrocity. Do the right thing and take a firm stand against the siege on Gaza, an invasion that many have warned may be recorded in history as another Holocaust. On May 8, 2016, eight years before October 7, 2023, an article was written in the Washington Post titled, The Israeli General Who Compared the Jewish State to Nazi-Era Germany. The article is about a speech that Major General Yair Golan, the then Deputy Chief of Staff of the so-called Israeli Defense Forces, gave while speaking at a Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremony at the Masao Institute for Holocaust Study. The general, sweat, the general said, quote, if there is one thing that frightens me about the memory of the Holocaust, it is identifying the revolting trends that occurred in Europe as a whole and in Germany in particular some 70, 80, and 90 years ago and finding evidence of those trends here among us in 2016. A month ago on March 7th, Palestinian author Susan Abu Hawa wrote, journalists and politicians call it war, the informed and honest call it genocide, what I see as a Holocaust, the incomprehensible culmination of 75 years of Israeli impunity for persistent war crimes. Rafah is the southernmost part of Gaza, where Israel crammed 1.4 million people into a space the size, of, the size of London's Heathrow Airport. No one can think or hope for what might come after a ceasefire. The ceiling of their hope at this hour is for the bombing to stop. It is a minimal ask, a minimal recognition of Palestinian humanity. Thank you. Thank you. So we have 13, 13 speakers. We're gonna take a five minute break um, at this time. Thank you. So who is the first speaker? We currently have 13 speakers on item number 27. Two minutes each. Two minutes each. Thank you. You will have two minutes each. As you see your name, please make your way to the next available podium. We have two podiums. And we'll start off with Alia to be followed by Nadia. Good evening, my name is Alia. I'm a wife and a mother of three children. And I'm just gonna keep this simple because it's been a long evening here and you have 13 speakers and it looks like we already know where everybody stands in this room. It's time to stop the genocide in Palestine forever. The only way to do it is to get every single person in the world to publicly stand against genocide. This means our family, friends, colleagues, elected officials, and representatives all the way to the president. The U.S. is the only country in the entire world that has the power to end the genocide with, with one phone call. This is why we continue to show up to every public meeting. We are working day and night to unite the world for humanity. The global pressure is working 
but each day that passes, more lives and limbs are lost. This is a genocide. It's not a war, not a conflict. Are you really going to continue to ignore this issue? And it's not an issue, it's a genocide. Children are dying, they're being killed deliberately. What's the difference between my children and yours? Why are yours more important, more valuable than mine? Why? Do my children deserve to die because of their DNA? I know you have bigger local problems, but we are your people. You guys represent us. You're supposed to represent us. And we're asking you to call for a ceasefire. It's a public statement. It's just a public statement. It's probably the easiest thing you could do. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Nadia, followed by Ellen Barton. Bartlett. Good evening. I'm here today to um, push again for my city council, the one that I pay their salary. I own two homes in Oceanside, so lovely property taxes, both valued over a million dollars. That's why I walked out, because I get calls every day asking for my home to be sold. So I think my voice should have a little bit of your attention, please. Thank you. So with that, I'm asking you guys to please put forth on the agenda an item to call for a permanent and immediate ceasefire. We will have some people that are pro-genocide ask you guys to not consider it because it's not a local issue, but time and time again, we show how the there's interconnectionality between these issues. And um, again, if they're supposedly for the hostages, the only time hostages are released are during times of ceasefire and negotiation. That cannot happen if they're still going out and doing airstrikes and white phosphorus and planning on their Rafa invasion, et cetera. The second ask that I have, which is not really an ask, it's a demand, is for our city to actually be serious about looking into divestment, not pretending to ask questions just to vote the other way without any consideration. I will be drafting things for you guys to review since I noticed that you guys don't like to do the work. Don't worry, I'm here to waste my time with you guys. Thank you, Ellen Bartlett, please. Ellen Bartlett, followed by Elizabeth C. Good evening. Me. Uh, Followed by Wendy Bravo. My apologies, oh. Wendy. Um, as Oceanside looks to update its climate action plan, we must recognize there will be consequences for all of us now and for future generations if we continue to fall well short of our goal. Although some would like to ignore climate change or present a false narrative that is of little consequence, the evidence is overwhelming. 97% of climate scientists have concluded it is a human cause, it is human cause and will affect all of us on this planet. Excuse Updating me. Updating our Hold cap on. to Hold make on, a Ellen. real difference involves, one, the courage to make tough choices. Second, the knowledge people, knowledgeable people with innovative ideas to guide the process. And third, funding to carry out our plans. You on the council must have the courage to make these changes that are necessary to reduce our greenhouse gases. It's easy to assuage oneself by updating policy directives, but unless steps are taken to carry these out, it means absolutely nothing. The council has voted to hire a CAP coordinator. This is an important step, but I believe the council's efforts will fall short without the help of a commission on sustainability and climate. My council member, Ryan Keim, felt this would be a wasteful, wasteful in light of former dysfunctional commissions. This is like throwing the baby out with the bathwater we would be able to tap into valuable, diverse expertise of people within our community and help the new coordinator and our already overwhelmed staff. And last, we need funding, which can be far better explored by a citizens committee than a lone coordinator. Funding can be, we need funding for programs that can provide things such as uh, subsidies for gas water heater changed out to heat pumps, electric shuttles as on alternative to individual driving, e-bike incentives. Um, it doesn't mean anything if our words are written in documents, but policies are never carried out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wendy Bravo. Followed by Elizabeth C. Well, I hope I can do this. I brought a bunch of pictures, but now I'm gonna have to synopsize due to the two minutes. 
Um, I would like to say that I'm an uh, oblate at the Benedictine Monastery, Prince of Peace Abbey. Um, it's called the Prince of Peace after Jesus Christ, and we spend much of our time there uh, praying for an end to war, the war in Gaza and uh, war in general throughout the world for its uh, devastating effect on, on us all. Um, I spoke to you a little bit ago about the aesthetics, uh, we'll say, of, uh, in the general plan having to do with uh, uh, preserving uh, this beautiful oceanside that we have in the riparian corridor so close on the uh, Pacific. I've sent you a, um, a um, this is my response. To, I've sent that to you, and, and you've probably read it. You'll hear from me again. I hope I can get through. Um, at any rate, uh, Oceanside's natural beauty uh, pro pro forms a, a living proof of how uh, aesthetics encompass environment to maintain life, in particular spiritual life, and the lives of all those who come to appreciate this town, look up on those beautiful bluffs, and uh, also who visit the abbey um, in, in retreat there. This is uh, the Wanus Project, uh, which you've heard about, uh, close on, on the... Um, on the uh, proposed plan. But uh, there's been a sea change uh, which is showing in press across the US. This is a uh, Wall Street Journal article, uh, don't build that e-commerce warehouse in my backyard and uh, talks about uh, a trend away uh, financially is a bad venture for these types of uh, developments. Uh, I object to it in its entirety and don't feel that it should be, along with uh, you know a few, a few thousand other people who signed a petition, don't feel that it should uh, be uh, mitigated or iterated or uh, downscaled, uh, but simply uh, rejected and the land put to some other use. Thank, uh, thank you, Wendy. Two more, please. Please, two more photos. It won't take long. The effect on the UPS. This gentleman right here in Maryland is, is holding off his land. He's an executive director uh, for his town, and I will quote him at another time. Thank you for your thank time. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Elizabeth C., Followed Honorable by Dan P. Honorable Mayor Sanchez and members of the City Council, my name is Elizabeth C. and I'm a resident and former business owner here in Oceanside. As a reminder, again, there was a ceasefire in uh, Israel and in Gaza on October 6th, and I stand here today to thank you for not engaging with the calls for a ceasefire resolution in relation to the Israel-Hamas war, and to request that you again never allow this item to be on an agenda, Oceanside City Council meeting Shh. agenda. There are three reasons why I ask you to say no to this ceasefire. The first is the war in the Middle East is an international affair, not a local matter. There are many local matters that you are dealing with. Number two, a ceasefire could easily be achieved tomorrow if Hamas would release the 134 remaining hostages, women, men, children, and babies who are still kept in underground tunnels in Gaza. 186 days they've been there. Return the people, lay down the weapons, the war is over. Hamas is the party rejecting ceasefire negotiations. Hamas does not want this war to end. Hamas wants dead Israelis and dead Jews all over the world. Three, one of the main reasons why protesters want a local ceasefire resolution is to fuel hatred against Jews and Israelis in our community. It's evident that criticisms of Israel are often a blatant disguise for anti-Semitism. This pattern of anti-Semitism highlights the urgent need for government institutions to take a stand against all forms of hatred and bigotry because we are normalizing hate. When we normalize hate, white supremacy groups are growing at alarming rates. Ceasefire votes normalize hate. Protesters' slogans normalize hate. Calling for intifada is calling for a violent uprising. From the river to the sea, a violent call. This war is not about land. This war is a holy war against Jews and ultimately against wet, the West and democracy. We understand this is a challenging time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Dan, Dan P. followed by Ryan Lynch. Dear Mayor and City Council, my name is Dan and I'm here to talk about anti-Semitism. On October 7, morning of the Jewish holiday, Israel was attacked by Hamas terrorists. They murdered more than 1,200 civilians and stole more than 250 human hostages. Among many atrocities, they raped young girls, burned young people alive, shot infants in their cribs. 
They also proudly filmed their actions with body cameras. As these horrors unfolded, you would expect people you, uh, to hug you, support you, and stand against such monsters. My experience was very different. It was before the Israel response and about a month before foot of any Israeli soldier stepped into Gaza. I was told that Hitler should have finished you, Jews, all, and that Hamas terrorists are heroes. Sadly, you won't hear rejection of these terrorist acts today either. You won't hear it because the toolkit given to these meetings guides not to criticize a resistance fight. This is an example when hate of Jews overcome fundamental human decency. I understand that today we were pressed to put for ceasefire resolution to criticize Israel. What's the purpose of this resolution? There is already a ceasefire proposal on the table. Let me quote U.S. top diplomat, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, just from yesterday. Hamas had been presented a very serious offer for truce and hostage deal that should be accepted. Hamas could end all this immediately and get ceasefire that would benefit people of Gaza and the hostages return hostages home. The fact it continues not to say yes is a reflection of what Hamas is really thinks about the people of Gaza, which is not much at all. I would like to also quote you Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin from yesterday. U.S. has not seen any evidence of Israel committing genocide during the military operation against Hamas in Gaza. Now, City Council, it's a question to you. Who do you tend to believe? American top officials, which every word is uh, checked, or lies of Hamas supporters who only go to incite hate against Jews and Thank Jewish homeland. Thank you very homeland. much. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Lynch, followed by Jimmy Knott. Hello? Uh, yes, hello, Council. Um, I am here along with uh, other speakers to call for a ceasefire resolution to be put on the table and um, to be voted on because we need a ceasefire after six months. And I, I have so much to say on this, but I just want to uh, counter some of what you just heard. From the Huffington Post, um, November 22nd, there's an article that is uh, conveying words from uh, Israeli spokespeople. Israeli government spokesman says war will continue even if all hostages are released. So this is a coordinated plan um, by Israel, unfortunately, to ethnically cleanse and commit genocide against the people of Gaza. We mentioned, you know, United States officials, we are actively funding um, and sending uh, weapons there. So we're not going to tell on ourselves and somehow, you know, show the blood that actually is on our hands. Um, and I would argue that it's, it's, it's on the hands of uh, councils like this who don't uh, call for ceasefire resolutions. Um, you know, just some more, some more th uh, things to tell why we're here and why we're going to keep coming back. Um, the number of children reported uh, killed in just over four months in Gaza is higher than the number of children killed in four years of wars around the world combined. That's from UNRWA. Um, you know, the, the North is starving. There's a, a very small fraction of aid trucks that are coming in that were, you know, that were coming in before. So the North is starving. World Central Kitchen tried to give in, its NGO tried to feed uh, people in the North, or, you know, in Gaza. And um, seven of their international team members were killed by Israeli airstrikes. I'm sure that's something you've heard about. Um, Oxfam saying people in northern Gaza were surviving on an average of 245 calories each day, less than a can of beans. So we need a ceasefire um, to be able to help the people who are in Gaza who are suffering. And that's the only way that hostages are going to be released. That's the way that we can uh, stop more thousands of people from dying. Um, and just a quick thing, and last, you know, foreign doctors have gone in and they have, um, you know, this is again from The Guardian, foreign doctors are going in. They're seeing wounds that are showing direct targeting of ch on, on children. Um, thousands of children have been Thank orphaned you, and killed. So there's, there's direct you. evidence that a ceasefire is necessary for the health of children in Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jimmy Knott, followed by Macy. Mayor, council members, Jimmy Knott, 127 Sherry Lane. Tonight, I wore this badge. Very simple. It's an age-related or age-advanced uh, badge of when I graduated from high school. I turned, a, I was allowed to advance my 69th round around the sun yesterday. And I wanted to go back in time. And what it Don't we is, all? so long ago, but the thing is, is when I was in my youth, we had a war. It was Vietnam. I had a few friends that never returned from Vietnam. There's been a lot of wars since then. There's currently wars going on now. 
Ukraine, Gaza, Nicaragua, a lot of declared wars, a lot of undeclared wars, mm -hmm. not just in Gaza, but affecting innocents everywhere. I think this council can do a favor like they did back in the 60s and 70s and stand against any war that's unjustified everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Macy, followed by Richard Newton. Laguna Beach, Long Beach, Pomona, Montebello, Hollister, San Francisco, Brentwood, Oakland, Cudahy, Davis, Ojai, Fort Bragg, Alhambra, Folsom, Pasadena, Santa Ana, Sacramento, Lemon Grove, Kerman, Madera, and Bell Gardens. You all say it's not your business, that it's not Oceanside's business. Then why have over 20 city councils in California alone called for a permanent ceasefire? Do the people of Laguna Beach and Brentwood care more about human lives than Oceanside? What makes us so different that Oceanside, the 2.5 million we send to Israel every tax season, we don't get to have a say in their genocide? The Sacramento City Council members have a conscience that listens to their constituents, and the majority of Americans in Oceanside just doesn't? Does our mayor prioritize her political image over the millions starving, being bulldozed, sniped, and exploded by the bombs her and her constituents are paying for? Why, Esther? Why are we so special that we can't do something so simple as saying this is unjust? and the city of Oceanside will not be silent as a genocide occurs. Why? We see how pressuring our officials works. We've seen how the State Department and top Democrats and even Republicans now condemning this as six aid workers and a Palestinian driver working for a World Food Kitchen were hunted like prey from three separate vehicles that were all airstriked while trying to deliver food aid to starving people. Of course, as you know, after sharing their coordinates, an entire plan with the IDF, even calling them while under attack to try and tell them that they had the wrong target. But they had the right target, and we've been saying this since October. They do not care if you're a pregnant mother, a child that's already lost everything and everyone, a disabled person in a wheelchair, or even their own hostages waving white flags and speaking Hebrew. This will never end in any kind of military victory, and you all know that. Agenda is a ceasefire, and prove to your constituents that you still have a soul somewhere in your body that is capable of using your power in politics to speak out against clear-cut war crimes. Clear-cut. Thank you, um, Richard Newton, followed by Michael Richardson. At the last meeting, a young woman stated that her generation had lived their entire lives under a state of war. War is tragic. It is also a constant companion to the human experience. I read somewhere that in the past 5,000 years of written history, there, have been, there has been less than 200 years of worldwide peace. There seems to always be a war somewhere. But warfare goes back even further. Archaeology looks beyond the start of the written record. For example, uh, the vulture Stella, spelled S-T-E-L-E, -E, from Mesopotamia shows uniformed, organized armies fighting and copious amounts of beheaded corpses while vultures fly off with their heads, predating the written record by a 1,000 years. Another constant hallmark of warfare is that peaceful civilians often endure the bulk of the suffering. It has always been a tragedy when innocent civilians are harmed as it was in the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center or on the October 7th attacks where innocent Israeli civilians were slaughtered, tortured, and raped by Hamas terrorists to the Palestinian innocent, innocents in Gaza more recently. It is always a tragedy. The chief lesson from history is that peace through strength works. America must maintain, must maintain her military strength to protect her interests and citizens. To be clear, I am an American and only loyal to America. I have no allegiance to Israel or Palestine. A ceasefire in Gaza has been advocated by many here. I'm all for it, but it must be bilateral. The terrorists must be turned over for prosecution. When Palestinians turn over all Hamas terrorists, then it would be proper to enact a ceasefire. But it starts with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michael Richardson. Hey, again. Uh, oh. Yesterday, I saw on the news uh, groups of protesting, protesters chanting death to America and death to Israel. Shh. You would think, I mean, Shh. that wasn't in, uh, in Iran. That wasn't in the Middle East. That was in Dearborn, Michigan. Now, in my day, that would be considered, that would have been considered uh, treason. 
And those, you know what they did with traitors in those days? I'm not suggesting that the people that are here calling for so-called ceasefire are traitors, but they definitely are misguided and uh, mis misled. <clears throat> there could be a, they, they, they've forgotten who the aggressor was here. And they don't realize, they don't understand that there could be a ceasefire today, this minute, if Hamas would just lay down their arms and quit fighting. But of course, Hamas doesn't want to do that because then they won't be able to keep, continue, continue to kill. So I, I'm proud of this council for not falling into that trap with all those other cities. You are the one shining light. Please don't do anything on this subject. Thank you, uh, Lucy Rios, followed by Christina. Christina would be the last speaker. So tax day is approaching, and I heard that um, one uh, local representative have got $17.7 million to make some improvements to the area here, you know, in Oceanside and North County for public safety, water infra infrastructures, and roads upgrade improvements. But I also heard that House Appropriations Committee have sent 1,000 times more money to Israel, $17.6 billion dollars is funding the war in, is in Gaza, okay? So if I'm wrong, correct me, please. But that's what's in the news. So 1,000 times more money sent to kill children over there overseas in Gaza and Palestine. When are we gonna call for a ceasefire? I don't want to pay for it. I'm done paying with my tax money. I want a money here where it belongs, in our city, in our state, in our country, not overseas, to kill children. It's, that's why we are mad. We're not mad over Jewish people. We love, I have a lot of Jewish friends. I'm mad about Israel killing children with my tax money. When is this going to stop? We need to call for a ceasefire. We need to call for a ceasefire. We need to stop funding the genocide and the killing of children overseas. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Christina. I really want to be associated in support with somebody like that. Um, a resolution for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. I type up these words wondering how I can appeal to your better senses, thinking to myself, try and be as nice and polite as possible. Maybe they can sympathize and have compassion for the cause if you come at them courteous and respectful. But then I think about all the people who have already tried to appeal to their humanitarian side and it clearly didn't make an impact. Why should I sit here and say, please listen and thank you for your time when you don't have an ounce of respect to show us nor the people in Gaza? It shouldn't have to come to these measures to ask our government not to be a corrupt piece of shit. America will never be as honorable a country as Palestine. You will never be as honorable as a 12-year-old boy devoting his time helping victims in the al Aska hospital as it's being targeted. You don't want to speak out about the oppression and ethnic cleansing happening over there because you don't want to expose the oppression you're partaking in here. You tell us to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, but you can't even acknowledge the fact that you're occupying stolen land, land of the free and the brave that may have been true before white people showed up. Now it's land of the slaves and the cowards. The fact that we have to ask your permission to make an active genocide an agenda item is despicable. The fact that you don't even respect Palestinians to say they matter enough not to be murdered makes me sick. Can you take a step back and look at your privileged life that you have and then compare it to a life in Gaza right now? I know it's not in your nature to think about others. That's apparent based on the fact that we're seven months into a genocide 
and we're still asking you to think about other people. But I just can't wrap my head around the fact that you know just as well as me the inhumane, cruel, and unjust crimes Israel is committing, and you're fine doing absolutely nothing about it. You're really okay continuing this country's legacy of racism and colonization against the people you need most? Please show me that that is not true before it's too late. Thank you very much. All right, we are now at, a Andy, could you come out? Andy, thank you, Andy. Um, we're now at um, General Council Member Comments. Right, we're, we're done, aren't we? Okay, Council Member Comments. Wait, I have one more thing, guys. Come on, one more thing. No, no comments? Okay, Andy, could you play this? I, there is someone who, born and raised in Oceanside, um, has made Oceanside proud this past week, and play it. This is about Tahina Pow Pow. To South Carolina, to the Two days before the NCAA tournament, South Carolina guard Tahina Pow Pow got a pleasant surprise. All the way from her hometown of Oceanside, California. It's so important to me to have my family here. Just seeing them come from the West Coast to come to support me, it says a lot about my family and just how this culture is bringing us together. The Gamecocks NCAA first round victory was the first time Pow Pow's dad and niece had seen her play for South Carolina in person. But throughout the season, when all of her immediate family can't make order, if you could please, if you're not willing to be, yes you are ma'am, if you're not willing to be civil, we have to ask you to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Shame. Uh, oh, baby, what's cracking? Hold on. You know, two days before the NCAA turn. I'm really sorry. I, I should. I probably should have waited till they left. But this is something very important to our city, to our city of Oceanside, that is very diverse. Um, we have uh, Polynesians, we have African Americans, we have the Latino community, we have the Lamb. We have so many communities here in Oceanside. We're very, very proud of uh, our communities, our, the way that we are together, that we are work, work together, that, that we, are, we are one. And so um, this is something that just happened this past week that put Oceanside on the map, that put the Pow Pow family on the map, and I'm asking you to please pay attention just, just a few seconds. Thank you. Philly, to South Carolina, to the whole family was cranking! <laughs> Two days before the NCAA tournament, South Carolina guard Tahina Pow Pow got a pleasant surprise. All the way from her hometown of Oceanside, California. It's so important to me to have my family here. Just seeing them come from the West Coast to come support me, it says a lot about my family and just how this culture is bringing us together. The Gamecocks NCAA first round victory was the first time Pow Pow's dad and niece had seen her play for South Carolina in person. But throughout the season, when all of her immediate family can't make it, extended relatives from across the country fill the stands. They're very big, as in um, <laughs> stature and as uh, members, so I'm sure they know who the Pow Pow families are. They have anywhere from 10 to 20 people or more at each and every one of her games, not home games. Everywhere we go, it's a multitude of people that's been supporting her. What makes Polynesians and Samoans so unique is the togetherness. We're taught from a young age that family is important and that we just have to be genuine and support each other and love each other. It's very important in our culture, as well as in my family, to have sports be part of who we are. They teach you who you want to become as a person. Pow, pow, wee, wee, from the corner. 
Pow Pow was born into a family known for football. At the age of seven, she hadn't yet found her sport, but her dad began including Pow Pow in her brother Israel's 4 a.m. workouts, teaching her the discipline that brought success to other members of the family. My Uncle Junior, say out. He's the one that really taught my dad the 4 or 5 a.m. workouts. That, that's where all this came from. In Samoan culture, just like first, second cousins, since he's an elder, we just called him our uncle. Uncle June gave him the blueprint on what it took to get to the league. He's the one that instilled in us everything that has come to fruition for Tahina. My dad would make me run around the track and be able to see what it was like to put in the work at such a young age. It was something that I always was like, hey, I gotta do what I gotta do to get like where he is. The toughness instilled in her by her family, along with a natural talent for the game of basketball, led Pow Pow to become a McDonald's All-American, playing three years at the University of Oregon before transferring to South Carolina in April 2023. In both instances, Israel moved with her, allowing her to keep family close and her culture first. The representation matters. I didn't really have that Polynesian Hooper that I really looked up to, especially female. And just being able to have, you know, like the Tina Pow Pow's or the Alyssa Peely's, we know that we gotta play with a chip on our shoulder and knowing that, hey, we're gonna be the inspiration for the younger generation. It's so important to have Papa on my back. I carry it with great pleasure, great love, great support, great trust, and the only thing I want to do is make them proud, knowing that I'm doing this for them. Hey, so that was Tahina Pow Pow, Paul Pow Pow's daughter, um, plays for South Carolina Gamecocks, um, beat the unbeatable. Iowa Hawkeyes and um, Caitlin Clark, there were 18.7 million viewers, peaking at 24 million viewers, the largest audience for any basketball game, men's or women's, college or professional since 2019. All right, Pow Pow family, all right, Oceanside, this is something to celebrate. Thank you very much for um, giving me those few a couple more minutes, and we are now adjourned to a workshop at 5.30 on Wednesday, April 17th, to discuss the fiscal year 2024-25 budget. Thank you so much. Good evening.